Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with the One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined today, and I'm joined as always by my good friend, Jessica Rabbit Lomas. <laughs> <laughs> surprise, surprise, surprise. I've got a little jab into Jason Neil Patrick Harris Johnston Ouch. Yellen. Thank you. Thank you. It's also good to be here with uh, Joshua Hatton and Jessica Rabbit Lomas. You're welcome. <laughs> Jess, it's so rare. I shouldn't say it's rare that we have you on the pad podcast, Padcast. I guess statistically speaking, it's rare to have you on, but it's always a pleasure to have you on the on the Padcast. No, oh, thanks. I would say it was more like quality over quantity or something. Something? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't say much about the two of us. Because <laughs> we're here all the bloody time. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make for a great episode when it's just a really awkward silence and somebody whistling through their teeth like <laughs> yep. Jess sitting here talking to herself uh, on a recording good luck Godspeed um, so Je- we've got a lot of things to cover today we have an interview to get to we've got news to get to but I, I wanted to bring up if you don't mind the fact that you've been gallivanting a little bit. You were in Germany yeah, uh, showing off some of our new wares. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know if you wanted to, to highlight some of the fun times you had in Germany. Some of the fun times. I had so many fun times in Germany. <laughs> uh, I, um, I feel like this is the start of a classic uh, shaggy dog's tale. You know, I uh, set off from my house one uh, classic Glaswegian cold and wet and rainy morning. It was a, a baking eight degrees, nine degrees. Uh, I flew to Berlin and I got off a plane and it was, uh, to my surprise, 32 degrees and extremely sunny. I got oh, off the plane a bit like, you know, when you, you come out of the cinema, if you've ever gone to a screening in the afternoon and mm-hmm. you come out and you're like, oh, no, <laughs> that's, that's how every single British person got off that plane when we touched down in Berlin Airport. Like, what? What is this? Why is it warm? <laughs> um, and just to be clear for our American listeners, when, when Jess is talking eight degrees and 32 degrees, that is, of course, <laughs> Kelvin. I mean, uh, uh, Celsius. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, could you translate... what, 172 Kelvin? <laughs> could you please translate that into American old money Fahrenheit? I, I don't know what it is. <laughs> you, went, you went from about 50 to about 80. Okay. okay. It felt like 80 degrees Celsius when I got off the plane. It was so shocking to me. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, But it was lovely. Um, and so we were taking part in um, a whiskey festival just outside Berlin called Copenica. Um, and it was really fun. It was a festival format that I've not done hmm, ever. Now I'm saying this out loud. Um, everything was in like kind of little marquees outside in like a, a nice kind of courtyard. So we weren't inside. Lots of whiskey festival goers will, of course, be into the traditional um, football stadium, you know, big exhibition room space uh, type setup. <laughs> um, everybody had their own marquee. And then we had a, a long table with uh, Prinius, our importers. Um, mm-hmm. And it was it was really lovely. <laughs> what was really funny is uh, my continued complaint as a whiskey festival attendee is that there's never enough places to sit down because, you know, I'm old now and I like to have a sit down with my whiskey. <laughs> this this festival, we were in front of a fire pit, which I need to remind you, it was already roasting. We didn't need a fire pit, but it was lovely. Um, a fire pit and there was um, some uh, really nice kind of like almost deck chairs. You sure you didn't get a plane to hell, Jess? No, no, I was, I was delighted, man. I was spending the whole time being like, okay. whilst I feel like I am too hot, I know that in okay. three days' time I'm going to be complaining mm. that it's not okay. even remotely warm anymore. So I was trying to um, absorb the vibes. Fire pits. Yeah, right. Very, was very there any cozy. Stone near to you? No, but it was just Did really you lovely. So much... a frying pan into the fire. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> I'm waiting for it was Germany. I'm waiting for you to make some sort of sausage jokes that I can't. I can't. The listeners can stitch that yeah, together themselves. We're, we're both vegetarian, yeah. Listeners are going to have to insert their own sausage humor here. <laughs> there we go. Insert your there own sausage go. humor, indeed. Yeah. Wow. Did anybody have like three minutes into this recording paging HR? <laughs> if you did, write that down on your scorecard immediately. Everybody. <laughs> It's a drinking game, paging HR. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it was it was really nice. And there was people sat with um, just kind of like chilling out groups in front of where we were. 
Um, it was a nice kind of obviously a little meeting point. They had live music. Um, nice. They had a woman who had made ice cream using whiskey. Ten Ooh. points to her. Delicious. We had like a Laphroaig ice cream and then there was like a hazelnut smoky chocolate thing. Uh, which you may have seen. I posted a picture of myself in one of the deck chairs eating an ice cream. Uh, <laughs> so that was, yeah, very unexpected death that occurs in Scotland in September. So, um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> we poured lots of whiskey. Why were we there? Uh, whiskey. Um, met lots of um, excited people who were um, very familiar with this festival, which seems to have been going for quite a while. Um, mm-hmm. I did a masterclass little uh beauty did you need a translator just out of curiosity or was was english a fairly commonly spoken language at the festival Uh, i was going to give you a witty retort in german no i did not need a translator um my (laughs) my extremely limited german which is sort of like yes no two sausages and a beer please got me through fine (laughs) Uh, it's probably more that everybody speaks exceptional English than my a terrible attempts okay. at German. Um, but it's funny, I, a lot of my kind of school German did come back to me. I felt like I was understanding good chunks of what was happening. Just a bit kind of tongue-tied and not necessarily able to, like, reply in English. Oh, German, mm-hmm. sorry. Mm-hmm. I replied in English, obviously. I didn't lose the ability to speak that as well. <laughs> yeah, I didn't feel the need to even reply Yeah, at I just all. did it all in mind. English, mime. German. Entire and- weekend in mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you brought the baguettes with you. Okay. Jess is doing her sausage mime right now. This is not appropriate, Jess. Just that, that speed dial through to HR. That's not, that's not a sausage. So not. <laughs> <laughs> Are they out of office? I've gotten out of office from HR. I think we'll be okay. I think we're okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, um, it was really lovely. And uh, it was great to be back with the Prenius team. Um, it was great to meet some new um, SCN fans. I'm going to call them fans. Uh, yeah. yeah. What What did you pour and how were oh, they received? Some pop quiz. Um, we poured some things from the previous the release. So there was actually, and this is going to really upset nearly everybody. There was some of our delicious Bomo on the table. Ooh, mm. The eleven year old Sherry Cask mm. one. Nom, nom, the nom, one that nom, is nom, delicious. Nom, yep. nom, nom. And I had several discussions with people who were very, um, I'm going to say, sceptical of Bowmore, because maybe they only know it from this hmm. previous era of the Joshua Hatton fan club, slightly soapier levels of Bowmore. There were several people. Oh, so the best era. Well, several yeah. people I had to <laughs> nearly forcibly make them drink it. Um, and then they all said, no, this is really delicious. So I don't know if it's because they're a bit scared of me yeah, or if it's because the whiskey's genuinely brilliant. I'd like to think it's the second yeah. one of them. <laughs> and that, that's David Turner, Eva right. Bolsonaro. And that was, right? that was my selling point was that I had uh, taken it to Isla and I had got the thumbs up from David who said it was j- really good. Uh, and I said, thank you very much. Uh, we just put our names on it. Uh, thank you. I can imagine David Turner saying really good in a really flat tone of voice. That's, that's the, <laughs> that like, is the level really of approval good. I'm looking for. Somebody who, if you're in America, right? so you'd be really freaked out this guy hates it. But I know that's like full endorsement. That I, that's the <laughs> praise I'm seeking. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm glowing right now from that Sometimes praise. I t- when I, did, <laughs> when I bought it for him, I told him on Isla that I was really nervous about giving him some of this. I said, I'm really worried that you're... Mm. <sighs> just be honest with me you know i can handle it i'll give mm-hmm. fingers crossed behind my back and he, yeah now he was um he's delighted with it so i am awesome yeah. delighted I am. really good <laughs> he's like i made really good whiskey good job yeah for, that's exactly i, I, well I went selected. full american i was yeah. like well you're welcome uh thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think you know, as long as he's given it a thumbs up, then I'm I'm very happy with that. Uh, what else did we pour on the table? We poured. Um, we had a couple of kind of like nice um, callbacks to previous releases. We had some Macmira, which was obviously hot topic whiskey given their recent news announcements. Um, uh, mm-hmm. And what else do we have on there? We had some other liquid that was in French oak and. Uh, ooh. I'm not sure I think what else I was pouring in the masterclass. 
I'm just thinking about the Linkwood and French so Oak. Good. We've been going around pouring the, the American California Oak wine yeah. cask yeah. Linkwood, and uh, and to, and referring to the overseas French Oak version. Oh, my both my favourite. I think Linkwood. that, and I've said that about nearly all of the ones from the release, just to form the ultimate incomplete list of things. Uh, it was, you know, <laughs> one of my favourite releases. Uh, we also had. The uh, Mac, uh, the Mac Mirror. We had uh, Croft and Gear, eighteen year old, and we had some of that Adam American oh, six year old, nice. which was. Uh, oh yeah! Oh, every time I know, every time I pour one, it, yeah. I'm like, God, oh, we did a. Mm-hmm. I picked a really good cast there. I have to whisper that bit because it's yeah. obviously a team oh. effort. This is a team sport. to take it where you can get it you went to the distillery you crawled across Mm. casks in corners of warehouses no literally I I did literally nearly get stuck on top of the cask which would have been very awkward and I've made Mm. a I'm pretty sure Connell definitely would have taken photographs of me like some sort of beached whale on the top of a cask screaming help get me down that would have been Oh my gosh! Is this where I is this where I insert the the audio from Horrible Bosses about bending you over a barrel and showing you the fifty states? But I mean, you you can. I'm just getting I'm p- paging it. I'm paging it. <laughs> mm. <laughs> uh, and the final one from that list, we had some of the um, I was calling it dark and dirty Dalian, the uh, that we had for this mm. side of the pond. So not the nine year old that went to the US. The 13 that was here so mm-hmm. yeah it was a really great weekend yeah. just kind of pouring whiskeys chatting um it was really lovely to be next to uh, lorena from lindor's abbey she is their master blender um we have we have oh, previously nice. met at a um whiskey judging competition but it was really nice to spend a weekend next to her and like it's always so exciting to me to listen to people who are directly influencing you know the liquid from the get-go um, so hearing mm-hmm. kind of her story and what she's looking for, and she's got a couple of projects that she's really passionate about, and um, working with some really funky cast types. So that was really funny listening to her, getting people excited about these casks and what's coming from Lindor's Abbey. Um, I also had mm-hmm. our, uh, I'm going to call them sister brand, Tim there from uh, JG Thompson. He was away down the other end, um, but had us yeah. kept us dancing mm-hmm. all weekend. Um, and then obviously the <laughs> lovely guys from Prinius, uh keeping us topped up. It's the only festival I work at where they have a dedicated beer fridge. Oh my So gosh. take That's... note to all our other markets. Uh, beer fridge is a great idea, when, especially when it's really hot. Uh, there's also sweets. Mm-hmm. Um, and Heiko always brings a bag of like marzipan because that's not too far from where they are in Kiel. Um, and yeah, Gerd and... Uh, Thomas kept me very busy. So thanks so much to the Prinius boys. It was nice to hang out with you. Sounds like a very good use of your time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great. Well, I always think pouring whiskey well at festivals is a great use of time. It's always good to hear what people yeah. think. Uh, exactly correct. I especially enjoy German brutal honesty. So there was there was a few <laughs> a few moments where I think maybe they thought I was really upset. And there was a, some people saying, no, I'm just telling you how it is. I said, that's great. We're all different, you know. It'd be very boring if we all like the same whiskey. So, yeah. I also have to give a special mention before we move on to a bunch of Danish guys who came to the table and brought me some of the most mind blowing whiskeys I've drunk in a long time. Uh, Mm Because apparently it's really normal to come to a whiskey festival with a backpack of your own whiskey, which contains things like Rare Malt's 1974 Brewers, 1980s Glenlockies, 1980s Dallas Dews. No, it's just regular. Oh, uh, 1989 Bomos, uh, just regular everyday drinking whiskeys. So, my uh, gosh, <sighs> what a treat! How 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 was the floral quality of the 1989 Bomos? I think it was. Don't spare any detail. Don't spare any details. I think it was quite like our uh, woodcut one. It had a tiny bit in it, but like not. Oh. Oh. For the listeners of the podcast on this audio format, Jason is pointing. At the woodcut series behind his shoulder. Um, yeah, it was. You, you can tell them how little remains in there, Jess. Well, there's like basically one dram just for me. Yeah. <laughs> Next time. Okay. All right. I'm just put my shoes on. I'll be around in half now. Um, yeah. So I. It wasn't that floral. I think it was a bit like our woodcut. There was a tiny touch of it, but certainly I've had much more um, Palmer yeah. Violet based 
um, examples of BOMOs. So if you were looking for FWP in that one, it was a kid in heads bottling. If you're looking for FWP in that, mm, you were going to be a bit let down, I think. But as somebody who wanted mm. to drink delicious BOMO from their birth year, I was delighted. So. <laughs> do you remember the bottling year okay if you Ooh, don't i Just curious. it was a couple of years old i think by the time they had brought it uh not that i'm online looking for it right now googling for it right this second <laughs> or 89 in the King cask Hedge. number it was yeah. from 2015 <laughs> quick, quick, it was quick, a 26 quick. year old ah uh, okay. 2015 okay when did we bottle our 89 woodcut uh, 2019 19 yeah it was 2019 because oh, it was a 30 year old right full 30 yep. well yep. yep well done well done yep there you go brilliant okay thank you i can complete my internet search okay. now <laughs> <laughs> in your own time so obviously lots to catch us up on germany so i really appreciate that i know after the interview uh, you'll be catching us up on some new global releases. I'm really excited to, to talk that. about, to dram along Very with you. Very exciting. But we've got Johnny and Angus from Kythe Distillery. And I wonder if you could just give us a little, give us a little primer on, on what we're about to hear. <laughs> uh, what you're about to hear is three of us sat around Angus's kitchen table discussing Kythe. And a pretty cool um, idea that's taken a long time to come to fruition and the distillery that the two of them are building together along with another partner. But you'll get to that in the interview. Um, And we just kind of had a little discussion. uh, And then Angus, who is a real uh, wizard for pulling out very old uh, bottles from his cabinet, uh, forced me. Listeners of the podcast, he forced me to try some really old, delicious whiskeys. It was really awful, but I did it just for the podcast. And you'll be able to judge so wanna... how terrible they were. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're, we're teased. We're suitably mm. teased right about now. <laughs> yeah, so there was a little discussion about um, how that's sort of helping to shape what they're looking to do. So, yeah, okay. it was it was a good chit-chat. I hope. I'll let you judge that then. <laughs> All right. Well, well, beauty. Let's let's let our listeners judge too, and hand it off to you, Johnny, and Angus. Hello, you are joining me from Deepest Darkest Fife, uh, and I am here today to speak to two gentlemen about a very exciting project. Um, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a second. Um, we are here to discuss um, Kythe Distillery, so I will let which one of you two win the thumb war, which is currently happening. Uh, you can speak first. I've, I've clearly got the more muscular thumbs. Thank okay, you. well done. Um, Wiry. Wiry thumbs, yeah, more more vicious thumbs certainly. Uh, anyway, let's, gnarly, let's, let's some might say. Uh, yeah, my name my name's Johnny McMillan. Um, uh, I'm one third of the directors of uh, Kaith. I used to work for uh, Berry Brothers and Rudd as their cask buyer for a good number of years, um, and also did Dramboree with a friend and um, Whiskey Show Old and Rare with with Angus. I would also just like to. To add that we are in Fife, which is where Angus's beautiful home is, but the distillery, in fact, is not in Fife. The distillery is very much in Perthshire, in the Highlands, safely across the Highland boundary. It is not a Fife distillery. Um, sorry, Francis. <laughs> and uh, I'm Angus McCrail, and I'm uh, also one third director of Kyle Distillery. And uh, I also am a director of Decadent Drinks, independent bottler, and occasionally a writer. And yeah, as Johnny mentioned, we've done Old and Rare Whiskey Show together in the past as well. And yeah, that's that's me. That's good extensive C V presentation. Well done. You've learnt your that's my one of my favourite bits of the apprentice is where they go through their CVs and they're like, I was chief leader of the Boy Scouts. And then like Claude does an investigation, it turns out you were never even in the Scouts. So um yeah, that's very good. Well done. So uh, two thirds of the Kai's distillery. Um, I have seen recently you guys have started making a bit of progress. You made a, a series of big announcements a while back ago about the project and what you were aiming to get out of it. Um, but I've got you here today to talk about a little bit about that in case we have any Padcast listeners who have been living under a rock and have not really thought about, you know, Kaith or Perthshire. 
Perthshire. Uh, and uh, so I was thinking maybe one of you could give us just a kind of like, get us up to, get us up to date. Where are we at? So, yeah, we've now, now started on site. Um, started a couple of months ago. Um, you know, the distillery is very much a kind of functional agricultural distillery. You know, we're not building a kind of grand design with like lifts and flares and dancing girls or anything. It's, um, it's two pre-existing barns. Um, so we're using the steel frames already there. We're using the concrete that's already there. So it's, it's you know, it's a pretty basic, basic build. All the energy is kind of going into the, the plant that's inside. Um, so yeah, we're a couple of months in now. Um, the 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 kind of construction bit is is well underway, and the plant the process should start going in towards the end of this month, end of September, with the refractory, um, and then the stills hopefully going in November, um, and the plant commissioning early twenty twenty five, and hopefully uh, filling our first casks, kind of first half of twenty twenty five. So soon, that's all very real yeah. for a project that uh, seems like it took you guys maybe a little while to get to this point of being uh, ready to start commissioning and production. Yeah, uh, it took us around about two hours to come up with the concept and 11 years to actually get to the point of being in construction. So, yeah, it's been quite a quite a long road here. I think, yeah, first sort of first half of that since we came up with this idea oh we'd like to have a distillery and we want to make this type of whiskey um was just figuring out how to do it and where on earth do you start when you know johnny and i are not rich we don't have money a lot of distilleries when they start they're often driven by people that have cash or are coming off the back of long careers in the industry can raise capital or people that own land or kind of a mix of all three and we had none of that all we had was a bit of knowledge and some ideas and uh, so it was a long learning process with quite a few false starts and you know trying to get to the point of having a site having some funding all this stuff and the, the game changer really for us was when um, our our third business partner Aaron Chan came on board with the project initially as an investor and then really more as like a, a, a full director and uh, you know, cornerstone investor for us. And he really had the missing thing which we lacked, which was a uh, good financial background and acumen and real common sense. Co- yeah, just <laughs> sort of, uh, you know, a lot of business experience and the ability to help focus our ideas. And so that really is where kind of this version of the project came from. We, you know, we stripped everything back that wasn't necessary and we just thought, right, what's the core most important thing here? It's let's make old style Highland malt whiskey and let's design the right, you know, kit and site and process and everything that can, that can achieve that. So that's, you know, and that since Aaron came on board and helped us with that, uh, has been the game changer and that's where everything really picked up over the last few years. And that sort of brings us up to where we are now. That's quite a refreshing way to think about it. I think because modern distilleries now are so much based on maybe not dancing go-go girls, but definitely something, you know, it's oh, a destination. Got a Johnny's got a penny. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that brings me to my second point in a sec, but it's quite an interesting um, ethos because now I think people uh, tend to think of distilleries as such a destination that I think you could almost be forgiven for the whiskey and the liquid actually being second place. There's a few distilleries that have popped up that are in very... Um, obvious tourist locations, you know, so that you get passing trans, uh, you know, busloads of tourists or something coming in, um, which, uh, although now I've just heard there are dancing go-go girls, um, I was told and I have seen that there will be no visitor facilities, no tea rooms, I won't be able to get a distillery tea towel. Um, that's quite upsetting as a... There'll you know, be some distillery tea towels, but they will just be unbranded tea towels that get used for <laughs> traditional tea towel for function. Um, so uh, you can have one of those in the future if you really only if you sign it with a sharpie um yeah maybe okay like a gold sharpie investment grade tea towel (laughs) no we didn't want to do uh, like so there's all the money on this project has gone into this kind of key eventual objective which is you know we want to make a certain style of whiskey a certain quality of whiskey and we've got this theory essentially of how to go about that and how to achieve that and we felt things like trying to embrace the tourism angle which the last few years has shown how fragile uh, that is in Scotland mm-hmm. and how 
I think it's very dangerous to make too many assumptions about that being a part of your business or, or a predictable part of a business. So we eschewed that and we definitely didn't want to make gin because it's just, it just absorbs your time and focus when what you really want to be doing is focusing on making whiskey, learning how to get better at making that whiskey and making more of that whiskey to lay down for the future and, you know, have a stronger business in the long term. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it just jarred with our message about what we're trying to do, particularly with regards quality. If you say we're making this incredible, almost ruthlessly ideologically sculpted, beautiful distillate and we're putting it into these really carefully chosen and managed casks and blah, blah, blah. And we're also doing this gin stuff on the side it just didn't really makes sense for us so yeah no tourists no gin just a small still commercial scale but modest functional working grubby very carefully thought through and designed distillery Okay, so now that I've put away my diary to come and visit you and uh, do a, a top-notch connoisseur's tour, which is probably, quite upsetting. You can probably come for a visit, Jess. Okay, yeah, don't, don't, don't tell anyone, anybody don't, else listening to the podcast. Don't tell though. anyone. Okay, yeah. no one's listening. Um, but the podcast listeners who are listening, who've just woken up at this point, are always very interested in sort of very nerdy, specific details. So you guys seem like the right people to chat to about this because I know that you have a couple of, especially um, unusual for Scotland, although I suspect generally the world of Scotch, uh, and malt whiskey, of course, uh, a couple of different pieces of equipment that you maybe wouldn't find in most of the other Scottish distilleries, starting with some, I don't know, actually, maybe you, t you can uh, identify some unusual features that you've got. Well, I think, I reckon we've put more effort into designing the process for this distillery than any other distillery in terms of having that really kind of key and singular objective of making a style of whiskey we want to make. You know, we know we want to make old style whiskey. How do we design the plant to ensure we can do that? And definitely the main challenge has been the refractory. So that's the, the bit that you burn shit in to heat up the wash still. Um, so our wash still will be direct fire. And I, well, we believe it's probably the first purpose built refractory for burning solid fuel. So for us, wood, historically coal, um, in Scotland for probably a hundred years. I mean, we, you know, we're not sure when the last distillery that built a coal refractory was, but you know, quite a long time ago. And that design process has taken in what, like, you know, five companies, three consultants, you know, just to kind of ensure this. You know, it sounds quite simple: burn some logs, heat some stuff up. But it's, um, you know, in terms of temperature control, having a door that doesn't take your face off. Um, you know, recirculating flue gas, all this kind of stuff's been 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 not die, not not die. Yeah, yeah not it's a good of, objective yeah. to have. I mean, we we yeah. did we did like a sort of hazard study, which you know encompassed several days and just listed all the ways you could maim yourself in a distillery. Um, but yeah, you know, the, I think the the, the refractory is probably the the most eye catching bit. But there's you know we've thought about everything from you know having an actual mash tun where you know most distilleries have a louter tun, similar but but different. Um, so we've got an, a traditional infusion mash tun, right down to things you would just never think of, like, you know, our washbacks fill from the top, which give more aeration in the wart, where most washbacks uh, in modern distilleries fill from the bottom. So it's just all this kind of incredibly nerdy detail, you know, split receivers, uh, you know, you name it, every single part has been thought through and designed with the singular, you know, goal of making amazing old style whiskey. Yeah, I think the thing about making whiskey is that it's it's not just one thing there's not one magic bullet or solution i think it's a it's about judgment and decision making <clears throat> and the accumulative effect of many many opportunities throughout the whole production process to make those judgment calls make those decisions and you know we've tried to bear that in mind as we've gone through this whole uh, design process you know every single part as johnny says has been poured over very meticulously <clears throat> and always thought about with like you know what is the solution here that's going to get us most effectively to that objective of astonishing quality old style malt whiskey down the line you know years from now you know, there's been really no money saved on process <laughs> you know the one example is you know uh, the transition piece between our still a line arm coming out and the worm tub outside was through an oversight going to be stainless steel it was going to cost 30 grand to have that transition piece made in hand hammered copper and we we went for that you know so there's really no you know our stills are coming from space side copper works now now four and space side 
Washbanks from GB Vats and, and Dufton uh, Mashton from Forsyth Northern Fabricators you know so we're getting top notch kit there's no expense spared on, on plant but when it comes to the actual building it's in I don't think we've spent a single penny on, on anything aesthetic there's one window in the office there's no window in the still house there's no you know, like fountains or anything like that you know it's, it, I don't think we've spent any money on aesthetics or any consideration given to aesthetics whatsoever so you know it's all the money all the focus has gone into process um, and yeah none on tea rooms or tea towels or cheese boards Sounds like you've not thought too hard about the old social social medias, the Instagrams, oh, no you, Windows. You wouldn't oh believe my goodness. the discussions yeah. that have gone on about uh, emoticons and their <laughs> and their use and or not use. Uh, no, we have. Uh, I think the thing about Kythe is that what sits behind it is uh, a real depth of thought and a kind of obsessiveness around all these aspects. So, you know, at, at heart, we are hopefully a a company about quality we want to be a company about quality a quality product and you know quality in what we do and you know when it comes to that when it comes to things like social media we've just started to do sort of regular posts now that you know planned every sort of couple of weeks Mm -hmm. thought through hopefully thoughtfully carefully written saying something meaningful saying a bit more than usual but not too much all these sorts of things have been uh pretty well considered in the terms of you know what's the bigger picture what's the long-term plan what's the grand master plan and you know we do want to be the sort of company that everything from the product we make through to how we talk about ourselves and what we say about ourselves is you know hopefully of meaning to our our uh, community that reads it or enjoys it or hopefully eventually drinks it i think for, for me authenticity is crucial here you know angus and i are and Aaron, we are like dyed in the wool, card carrying, final stage whiskey nerds. There's no doubt about it. And you know, we want to be able to look ourselves in the mirror throughout this process. So, for me, just telling the truth of what we're doing, you know, sticking to the like authentic romance of what we're doing is enough. And so, you know, we can put out these, you know, beautifully written by Angus um, social media posts. And they're all true. You know, we're not we're not posturing. We're not saying anything that's not true. We've put all this effort in, so we can talk about it truthfully, and hopefully that that kind of passion, that authenticity comes through. Yeah, I I think it does. And also listening to you talk about it, it's obviously not just a set of uh, words that you've put together for a business plan. It's pretty obvious from everything you guys have got through so far that it's not just an idea that you were like, well, whiskey seems popular in Scotland. We could have a crack at that. Yeah, I think that was something that I always. It always really put me off Scotch whiskey or the Scotch whiskey industry. I mean, I've always loved Scotch whiskey, the product, but I've never really been much of a fan of the industry in inverted commas. And uh, everything I've tried to build in my career, and you know, with the business partners that I work with, and you know, now absolutely more than anything else with Kythe, is trying to build something where the truth of what you're doing is is enough to sell it. And try to build something where you create value through quality, not through, you know, a big, long plan about volume and expansion. That's, you know, th- that's the thing that underpins Kaid is that we create a set amount and we control that amount and we put as much effort as humanly possible into making sure every drop of what we produce is astonishing quality. And then that is what builds the, the value for the company in the long run. I like the use of uh, the idea of astonishing quality. Uh, do you have some metrics that we can maybe share with the pad costers about, um, you're saying astonishing quality, I am sort of pulling your chain a bit, but um, to the average perhaps whiskey consumer who maybe haven't had the privilege of drinking the kind of stuff that I know you two have had in your cupboards and in your glasses, um, how how's that going to um, be sort of conveyed to the people that eventually hopefully are lucky enough to stumble across bottles of Kai? That they, is it going to be so unrecognisable to what they are perhaps drinking as a modern drinker? Yeah, so I think for a modern drinker, they'll notice that what we put out is not dominated lopsidedly by active oak flavouring. I think a lot of active wood is deployed in Scotch whisky maturation now as an agent of flavour rather than an agent of maturation. And I think that people will notice that what we've produced, what we put out, what we sell is something that represents a balance between distillate, charismatic, identifiable distillate with a, with a real DNA about it and a personality and an accent its own and that 
gently sculpted and matured by oak, but not in a way where the oak is dominating or aggressive or creating an imbalanced product. I can let you taste something that might <laughs> illustrate that. You know. Oh, dear listeners, you I, can't I, see I these bottles on this question. table. Yeah. Well, it wasn't, but you know what? We'll just pretend it was. Um, I think I'd, you're obviously preaching to the converted here. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to have eyes on you, especially, I know we're talking kind of 10, 15 years ahead of ourselves, but watching it, I mean, what you're talking about is what I regularly joke about as having as a knackered wood series, where everything is just matured in third and fourth fill hogsheads that are very boring. It comes out pale as piss like I am, but it creates character and flavours and complexities in the whiskey that it's not overrun by tannins and very active wood. Knackered wood is one of my uh, favourite uh, return to phrases in Scotch whiskey <laughs> descriptors and uh, actually it features on the rear labels of uh, an uncountable number of sponge bottlings I think. Um, Alright so I'm going to let you try, I'm going to put the microphone down, I'll let you try one thing blind and then we can try a few other um, bits and pieces because this, this is a good indicator of uh, what I mean by old style whiskey. Okay, it's a stressful. And I'm going to do. I'm going to do something which I don't normally do, but it's really uh, a bit annoying. Which is say, guess what this is. So <sighs> this, this is my worst nightmare. Oh, when I'm, people I'm say just, things like, "Tell we, us what it is." We were out for dinner with one of our investors in Edinburgh, um, who's you know a, a friend of ours, and that was the first thing Angus did to me. I'd just got back from a weekend in Belgium where I drank you know gallons of Lambic beer with you know, Billy Abbott and John Beach and all those kind so of So you had a top performing palette ready to go. I was ruined and Angus poured me something blind. I think it was his spring bank bottling. I said, guess that. And clearly I missed by, you know, a hundred miles in 20 years. Um, but, uh, all right. So I've just given you a glass. Now you have to guess what that is. Oh, no. Okay. Well, while I'm, um, scientifically nosing this whiskey in a way that would be great for an Instagram profile picture. Uh, you two are going to have to carry on talking about some plans about the distillery. Go. Well, um, something that I think is... We haven't talk, spoken about it publicly much yet, but it's something we put a lot of work into um, is our plan for wood, and particularly sherry casks. So we've been out to Spain and spent a lot of time developing relationships with a couple of cooperages. And we've got some sort of some really interesting casks being seasoned and being sourced, which I think, again, feed into this idea of thinking through every stage and thinking through in a way of like what's going to get us this old style profile. Because obviously with uh, being a sort of distillate being at the heart of what we do, we want to give that a lot of room and a lot of space to breathe. And so we'll be using lots of refill wood. But when it comes to sherry, we do want to have a meaningful component of sherry in the warehouse and that to form a, you know, a, have a meaningful role in the final character of Kai when it's a single malt in years to come. And so there's some, I think, some really interesting uh, stuff going to come from what we've been commissioning out in Spain. So that's something that's, I think, I'm pretty excited to see and eventually I, I, arrive. I, I guess for me, the opposite side of the production process is the barley. Um, so we're really fortunate in that Kaith is on a a farm um, owned by a farmer who's, who's also one of our investors who's he's a pretty progressive farmer and he was delighted to try and grow some Maris Otter for us um, so we actually seeded that last year it's a winter barley and it was harvested a few weeks ago uh, we got uh, 70 tonnes of, um, of our own Maris Otter um, so that should do uh, about a quarter of our production I think um, in so the first year so that'll form the first runs of spirit next year and that'll be floor, mal floor malted for us and that's a really an old 60s brewing varietal that was for you know making ale and things like that really it was a beer beer brewing varietal so it's something which won't yield as much sugar it'll have a more <clears throat> a higher proportion of uh, proteins in it so that's the sort of thing which will mash really well and ferment really well and give us more building blocks to convert to flavour in fermentation stage, which is really sort of fundamental. Again, as another big fundamental component to making this sort of charismatic distillate we want to make. We've also been fortunate enough to get that grown. So David's um, has, has a leaf accreditation, which is uh, linking environment uh, and farming. Um, so you know, it's kind of regenerative growing, low inputs, less fertilizer, etc. Um, which is something I think we'd like we'd like to move towards over the years. Eventually, having a hundred percent of our barley grown that way um, on the estate by by the farmer. 
I think that's really interesting. I was in, um, I was lucky enough to go to the US last year and I went to the bread labs up in Skagit Valley um, in Washington state. Um, and it was really interesting talking about um, kind of grains, but also about this idea of maybe moving away from hyper commercialization about how to go back to being, uh, what I'm going to call gentle growing, like, you know, not so much pressure put on the ground, not so much pressure put on the grains, but also being aware that we're in a very changing world. Um, it's not easy to escape the fact that it's rained for the entire entirety of whatever summer is meant to be in Scotland yeah. um, so obviously I can imagine that farmers are looking to trying to find slightly more weather resistant um, crops and styles of barleys especially as we're in Scotland talking whiskey but you know grains that are more resistant to the change not just the traditional looking at maybe not like diseases and variations but also fundamentally if it's going to rain for the whole summer well you need to have something to harvest come the end of that um, and I, I saw I can it's interesting to me that you guys are thinking about it in a much more holistic approach. It's not just, we're going to make really nice whiskey having sourced this. It's a step out, like zooming out one step further of, okay, so we want a uh, local barley that's accredited in a, uh, you said leaf accreditation, mm-hmm. um, you know, something that we can use to affect ch- flavor before we've even put it anywhere near any equipment. We both really care about um, the sustainability and meaningful sort of ethical uh, and authentic green credentials that sit behind this project like we both neither of us want to be involved in a project that doesn't put that at the heart of what we're doing and and make a you know a genuine effort and so that when we talk about it or have something to say it's not greenwashing it's not bullshit like we've looked into it we've done our best and we know there's always going to be room for improvements like scotch whiskey is not a particularly you know massively environmentally friendly thing to create but you can do it uh, in a, a better and more you know environmentally considerative fashion and that's what we're trying to do and we you know we see uh ways to f- even further improve it you know down the line as we go along so uh it's something that we'll talk about whenever we've got something you know meaningful and you know demonstrable to say mm-hmm. okay, and i think i think it comes back to that idea of a sort of genuine beauty within the product it, it, it's hard to really you know, drink a glass of whiskey and say, oh, you know, it reminds me of the beauty of Scotland, but the things made by like a massive diesel boiler and, you know, pumped out into grain that's just been grown with fertiliser and things, it's difficult to really kind of have genuine kind of authentic, authentic beauty behind that, I guess. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky, it's a conundrum we both have, I think. If we, you know, if our first care here was to do something that's low carbon, good for the environment, don't build a distillery yeah. that's, that's not our reason for being <laughs> but you know we want to make amazing whiskey and actually the direct fire thing helps us lower our, our carbon emissions so because the the wash still is wood fire that means we can run the rest of the distillery on an electric boiler so it really it takes the load you know the main the main heating load for distillery is the wash still so the rest of it's an electric boiler so you know we're hopeful we can put in solar panels in the first few years so that that should lower our emissions to something like 95 percent less than a, a light for a light kerosene distillery which which is, which is great and also our community and our our uh, customers that we want to sell to they, these people are educated and intelligent people buying a product like this and they care about this shit as well so you know e- even from a a business perspective looking forward it it makes sense to do this as well i think anyway jess as an industry professional you've had more than enough time to guess hoping, precisely what distillery this is I was hoping uh, to uh, continue talking about sustainability until uh, one of us two of us have to leave so uh, no, i am um, afraid you have to be put on the spot i then. also know you and I, I wouldn't be surprised if you were also just like oh this is a surprise armagnac made in guatemala no, no. this is a, this is a <laughs> single malt scotch whiskey Okay, well, that's a standard that's, distillery that's expression. That's good. That, that narrows it down a bit. Uh, I think it's. Uh, oh, I was gonna. I was gonna name shame some people. Then in my impression, I will not name. You can. You can imagine who I'm impersonating. Uh, I'll write you some terrible tasting notes. Uh, it's really fruity. It definitely. And I don't know if I'm being led here by you telling me that this is an old. Um, old distillery expressions my brain's looking for like old kind of dusty fustiness in it where maybe it isn't it's definitely got some really nice kind of peachy floral notes to it and it's definitely gentle it's surprisingly gentle so the point of this is not necessarily about the the quality of it although i think it's a nice dram i think it's a lovely dram but it's it's glenmorangie 10 year old bottled in the 70s if joshua was here he'd be all over this this is one of his favorites but i think this is a great illustration to anyone 
that thinks that Scotch whisky hasn't massively changed in style as a as a, as a broader product. Certainly, Scotch malt whisky. I think you put this next to contemporary Glenmorangie ten or twelve as it is now, and you get a really perfect illustration of. So this is something I would use more as an educational piece. Mm-hmm. Going back to what we were talking about earlier, if we're talking to modern whiskey drinkers years from now, pouring them the first bottlings of Kaith, talking about that, something like this, along with its um, you know, modern-day contemporary bottling, uh, would show you immediately what the difference is between old-style and modern. You know, modern Glenmorangie, it's about very good quality wood, but it's not as much about distillate, really, whereas this is just knackered refill wood, plus <laughs> really elegant slightly old school Highland distillate that's got a bit more body to it. It's got some fruit, it's got some waxiness. And uh, I think it's a really good illustrator of that. And from there, I would propose you uh, a dram of something a bit different, which is more about quality and kind of something that inspires us and a, uh, and a, a something that would be a good indication of, like, if we could make this, we'd be pretty happy. I think, I think it's well, Alright, in the name of science, I'll do it. I think it comes back to character as well. You know, again, modern whiskey can be fantastic, and there are some amazing modern bottles of whiskey. I'm not not saying there's not, um, but I think when you when you're lucky enough to try a whole load of drams distilled in the 50s, 60s, 70s from the sort of you know the the Grand Cru distilleries, you know, Glendronach. Um, Glen Grant, Speyburn, Longmorn, any of these, any of these phenomenal distilleries, um, you know, they have they have character. They're 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 different. You know, they all they all kind of vary from each other in a way that I think modern whiskies vary less. You know, the sort of the the flavour map of modern whisky I think is less diverse than old style. And for me, the kind of ultimate goal for Kai is to make something that's really recognisable that has character. That you know, fifteen twenty. 50 years from now, people doing podcasts or whatever people listen to in 50 years' time, you know, be able to pour a drama Kaith blind and someone goes, oh, well, that's clearly Kaith. You know, it's got that character. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's probably the ultimate goal. I do think in some of my favourite distilleries, um, in the liquids that you get to try, and I'm not even thinking of, you know, things that come out of people's pockets at festivals or, you know, kind of poured from unlabeled bottles if you go to distilleries, They're like core products that we could walk into any shop and buy, you know, whether it's a supermarket, a specialist retailer. Uh, I do think for me, the ones that I like the most have very recognisable characters. So I, I, again, what you're talking about with Kaith totally chimes in with what I look for in a whiskey because I want something that you can riff on that, but that, you know, the solid base of what the whiskey is underneath still remains there. So that's oh, all sounding very, um, very much in my lane. And I imagine to a lot of the podcast listeners, what you're saying is really just music to theirs too. Well, I think that's what attracted me to malt whiskey originally is the, you know, following a distillery and seeing from year to year, bottling to bottling, that you've got this variations and changes, but there's always some sort of underlying recognisability. That's, you know... That's the sort of bedrock of my passion for the drink, really. I'm hopeful as well our, our production will lead to a bit more seasonal variation. You know, so there's a couple of different things, but I think growing our own barley, you know, that that's going to be more affected by the weather if we're only taken from one single location. Different yeast, so we're, you know, going to be working with local breweries, we might change which breweries we work with year to year. And also, you know, having a longer fermentation, you know, we're thinking up, we have capacity to do up to two weeks as standard. So, you know, if it's a hot year, our fermentation might be a little bit shorter. If it's a cold year, our fermentation just might be a little bit longer. Um, so, you know, all, all these also things... Also cooling as well. Yeah, cool, absolutely. You know, all the all these things from... I think I think our production is going to lead to slightly more seasonal variation than standard. Yeah. Something we'll lean into rather than try to manage out. You know, I think that with really the really interesting alcohols of the world, uh, it's like a tension between human activity, human decision-making and... and nature's influence as well i'm not talking really about terroir here more just about you know the specifics of the site and the you know our decision making role as whiskey makers when to step in when to step back so i I mean two weeks of the fermentation i think would make most modern distillery managers scream that's well i suppose so but then the beauty of our project is that we don't have to do 410 liters of alcohol per ton you know we've modeled and assumed that we're going to be around about 310 Okay. Which is that would make uh, I think that would make most 
distillery managers at like Diageo sites, I think their heads would just explode. Yeah, extremely anxious. Those are low sounding numbers. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, well, to, to, put, to put some sort of flesh in the bones for people that haven't studied price of barley and um, LPA per tonne of barley, you know, a standard tonne of barley at the moment in Scotland, you'd probably get sort of five, six hundred pound um, for commercially produced malt. The stuff we're looking at is going to be more like thirteen hundred pound a ton, mm. and if you were to process, um, I don't know what the modern variety everyone's using, like sassy or something, if you used uh, kind of you know paradigm barley, that's going to be four hundred and ten liters of alcohol per ton of barley processed, and the way we're looking at processing our mar sort of a brewer's yeast, it's going to be three hundred and ten liters of alcohol. So you know we're going to pay more than double the amount per ton, and we're going to make you know, like three quarters the amount of alcohol from it. So. You know, I guess what I'm trying to get across is we're making real sacrifices here financially in terms of efficiency in the plant. But, you know, the reason we're doing that is because it's going to taste good, you know, and what's the point in making whiskey if it doesn't taste as because good? Because efficiency is the enemy of character. <gasps> Thank you. Is that a oh, man, point? I had that on my bingo card for you to say at some point during today. <laughs> free, free tattoos in the day of Kaith. Angus will tattoo <laughs> efficiency is the enemy of character onto anybody. I just part. came up with that line and I'm, I'm surprised by the amount of people it's wound up. People come up to me at shows and say, I've you could the sufficiency enemy of character thing. Oh, I don't agree with that. Are they German? No, they're, no, they're it's quite a few people in the industry. That's it's annoyed. It's, Is that which part I'm of quite the pleased by. So. Full eleven years to come up with that. That's why two uh, hours to make a distillery. I don't remember when I came up with it. Just came up when we were <laughs> writing when we were writing copy for a business plan. I think is when we, we worked with, with Dominic Cummings. Um, so when Angus does a sort of talk on his lecture and it says efficiency is the enemy of character on the front. It does sound like it's absolutely ripe for being a meme. Could exactly. be, yeah. Although I, I wouldn't thank you for calling me the Dominic Cummings of whiskey. <laughs> that was seamlessly done as well. That's Possibly no the, hesitation. Yeah, most offensive thing you, you, anyone's you could ever be the said. Campbell, then. Uh, uh, only one or two steps up. Uh, um, so this is uh, the Pad Costas can't see this. Maybe I'll take I, a picture and send yeah, you. No, but um, it's got a whole series of little words on this that I really enjoy. Starting at the top of the label here, we have a perfect self whiskey. Which sounds like that came out of chat GPT. Well, it's actually a really ancient bit of lingo for single malt, which is beautiful. I think just the, f- yeah. I, I love all of this. The, yeah. Just I also gorgeous. like this little blue box down here highlighted says most suitable for medicinal purposes. Yeah. Not for enjoyment, not because you like it. It's only for medicinal purposes. This is a very beautiful, you can tell me it's old, uh, a very beautiful bottle of Glendronic, mm-hmm. which is uh, light years away from the last Glendronic that I tried. Yeah, so this is, I think, a really good indication of the kind of quality, character. There's a lot of things about this whiskey which mm-hmm. I think are things that we would call objectives to, to try and achieve. So it's bottled, it's an official bottling bottled around the early 1950s. And what's very cool about it, which um, I didn't realise until I opened it, I, I bought this specifically to open and take to the the whiskey show in London from my old and rare stand. But um, it's it's had the ABV thing on it crossed out and I dipped a hydrometer and it's actually a foolproof example. So like 56%. So it was probably about 50, probably 100 proof, 57.1 when it was bottled. And it's just a great example of a really charismatic, fat, heavy, old style Highland malt whiskey. It's non-age statement. So it's probably quite young. Uh, it's the fact that it's a really high proof means that it's well preserved. So I think you get a really close to proper old style Highland malt whiskey making of that era. So probably forties um, distillate. It's you know at that high strength, it's very very thick, really waxy. I get these fantastic like hessian cedar notes off it. So it's medicinal but without being hugely peaty. Just like warming, peppery, thick. Yeah. Like, just, Immense I'm so, characteristics. I'm amazed for its age how peppery that still is. And it, it's the the light coming through your kitchen doors. You can see the kind of the way it hangs onto the glass once yeah. I put it down is and yes, it's such a treat, thanks. Also I, I love about it as well is that it, there's no obvious like intense wood character about it. No. It's it's it feels like a you know, a mature malt whiskey. Um although it obviously has a bit of that um, you know, power of youth. But it doesn't feel like something that's been, you know, put into active wood or, or where the wood has been kind of managed in it. It just feels like something that's come out of, you know, a decent oak cask. And I'm also guessing, though, that this whiskey is obviously purposely illustrating your point, which is it comes from an era when I don't imagine distilleries were thinking about casks in half as much detail as they do now, this idea of, you know, like, I mean, you've already said we've got 
you've talked about your distillery and we're, we're kind of not producing liquid yet, but you guys have already been out into Spain and you've got a, pro, a process and a program in place for casks and seasoning and all that kind of stuff. I can't imagine that Glendronach in the era that this was distilled and made really had time to think about going on a trip to Jerez. I think they're probably busy recovering from the war and not th- thinking too hard about it. I think so, but I also think that they benefited from a really totally different uh, industry of, and market for sherry and a really um, like rich seam of sherry casks just constantly influxing into the UK. You know, a lot of um, people in the UK, not just old people, like, you know, as associated now, but a lot of people regularly drank sherry and regularly drank, you know, cream sherry, lovely sort of rich, oloroso-driven, slightly sweetened sherry. And you'd get these fantastic old uh, transport sherry casks, American oak transport sherry casks, bringing this liquid into the UK and then, you know, disgorged, while still very fresh, being just sent up Scotland or sent over to distilleries to be filled. So, I think that, uh, and the you know the later absence of that is a big part of what kindled a kind of, and you know just a general shift in terms of the approach to making and selling, particularly malt whiskey. You know, helped to move attention more towards wood because wood is something that's controllable and it's rapid. Mm-hmm. And I think anything that can eat away at some of the sheer relentless length of time it takes to make and put out, you know, good quality whiskey. Understandably, people like the idea of, you know, turning their heads more towards wood than to aspects of production and distillation. I also think it's a kind of shame the way uh, drinks, I guess, trends and uh, fashions have changed. Every Christmas, our tasting club, we've quite often done, uh, we've picked a distillery and then a load Mm -hmm. of their releases and put... Um, like broken them down so last Christmas we did a Kilhoman so we had uh, the Kilhoman Madeira cask with some Madeira we had you know the PX or the PX cask it always fascinates me how many people when we pour these fortified wines that seem a bit mysterious and dusty in the back of your granny's cupboard when we pour them people are like oh shit this is great and cream sherry every time people are like oh I thought it was going to be like a Bailey's thing I think the name's slightly misleading now that we're so mm. far away from being regular consumers of sherry people are always really surprised when you pour it they're like oh this is actually this is really nice I just, I just need people to make the final leap and start like being going out and drinking more sherry so that it's less of a weird conversation to explain I think cream sherry as well is quite a um, it's such it can be quite a broad spectrum product from extremely sweet to relatively dry kind of off dry and it can be young and not very good all the way up to very old made of outstanding components and a beautiful drink um, I mean, uh, cream sherry is what we are using to season our our casks for uh, for Kaith. I mean, with the the, th- the thinking behind that being just that, well, what were people drinking in the 50s and 60s when all these amazing casks were coming into the country? Predominantly, they'd be drinking cream sherry. Mm-hmm. And so that's, we, we sort of worked from that perspective to design our sherry cask supply and programme. So you mean we're not going to be seeing Kaith in oh, tequila casks or? Um... Yeah, I think I think last, last, <laughs> last time, last time we spoke to <laughs> someone, this is a big someone mistake. mentioned red wine, and I think I went off on one. Um, I, I, I am I am personally not a fan of red wine casks uh, in in the use of whiskey maturation, or for that matter, white wine casks. No, or, they're atrocious. Yeah, or tequila, or any of that crap. Um, if people like that kind of stuff. Good for them. I hope they see the light. Um, no, <laughs> you know, I, I, again, I, I come back to the fact that uh, you know, I, I want our distillate to shine through. You know, I want it to be sure. to be recognisably kind, not a kind of like fun thing to try because it's in a weird, funky like Crimean red wine cask or something. I think I think there's a place for it in the industry. I think people who are looking for that, I too really struggle with red wine casks. Uh, one of my very best friends who will be listening to this probably as he's on a long walk uh, is a diehard fan of red wine casks. And I, sorry Flo, he's, he's I can't get behind it. To sort himself out to try and... To, well, he's he's always he sniffing like? out somewhere so it'll do him a strong red wine cask. So I, it doesn't, it does nothing for my palate, but I appreciate that we're not all the same and we don't all eat the same food, so why would we all drink the same whiskey? So within an industry, what I love 
about whiskey is there's a place for people who want um, heavily sherried, fast finishing, fast matured, sped up almost whiskey and people that are doing what you're doing, which is kind of the absolute as far away removed from it, the idea of taking everything slowly and just letting the spirit kind of crack on with itself. I think there's a space for everything in you know, most things in whiskey nowadays, and it's, you know, it's a bigger community around the world. It's a bigger culture. Like obviously there's a broader swathe of tastes and preferences. Um, I suppose ours, as Johnny, um, so eloquently, uh, illustrated are a bit more traditionalist. I mean, I think, you know, Sherry has been proven to be a, a, a beautiful match with, mm-hmm. with Scotch whiskey when done well. Um, just as you know, we want you know plenty of casks in a warehouse, which are just humble refill hoggies and barrels that are going to let our distillate shine. Um, and that's another thing about you know our plans is we don't want to be a, a particularly like single cask driven brand or you know malt. We want to be putting out bottlings which have been a little bit more carefully put together and you know a bit of blending, a little bit of activity in the warehouse to kind of manage casks towards the point of you know showing at their absolute best um and that's going to be all sorts of stuff from you know playing around with different filling strengths through to different filling levels in the cask through to aeration marrying re-racking you know carefully into other refills perhaps to help bring different parcels of casks together create you know nicely rounded unified character all these sorts of things want to you know we want to put at the heart of our kind of practice around kai then um you know, there will probably be, well, undoubtedly be some single casks, but we don't want it to be the kind of the core of what we do. Um, and, you know, in time we might look, you know, I mean, I suppose if I was, you know, put matches under my fingernails, I would say that I think Saturn sometimes works quite nicely, but I, th- I suspect it, it, things like that is like way down our uh, list of priorities to do with Kai that we want to do really good sherry, probably a bit of diversity in terms of the sherry cast we fill but really good sherry filled as new fillings and given chance to properly integrate properly mature and we want to do refill wood and some first fill bourbon really i think an interesting project for us is going to be to try to bring out the sort of super fruity character that we hope kite is going to have at a relatively young age you know we don't we don't want to properly release our whiskey till it's eight, ten years old ideally, but we'd like to do a few sort of like test case bottlings along the way. Um so I think we, we draw a lot of inspiration from from cognac maturation, certainly. Uh-huh. You know, our our, our friends uh, Jean and Amy who have uh, Jean Luc Pasquet distillery and, and cognac. <sighs> Fuck me, you know, try their four year old cognac. It is incredible. They're organic four year old. Um so you know we we've we've talked to them about how the um how they mature that and as I just mentioned things like aeration trickle dilution over the years um, yeah we've, we've got quite a few ideas between us about how we how we produce something that's maybe you know five years old and just has that like abundant in your face fruitiness um, so yeah there's a few few kind of fun projects that we had in the warehouse in the first few years I think that's another thing as well is that the big question mark for us is at what point do we know we're on the right path because obviously uh, inherent in this um, this whole concept is that there's going to need to be a little bit of playing around, a bit of experimentation in the early years. And that's, and again, going back to what we said earlier, we've designed a kit and a process to help us do that. You know, we've got lots of receivers, the ability to, you know, split different runs and, and fill them separately, track them separately. So we'll be able to say, you know, right, this thing with fermentation pairs really well with this particular approach we took in mashing, etc. So let's you know, add all that together. And our hope is that within the first couple of years, we'll have sufficient evidence in the warehouse and confidence to know that, like, this is the route we want to get into. This is the path we want to really drill into. Because we don't really want to do lots of different uh, named makes or anything like that. We just want to do Kai, the single malt, and it'd be one distillate that we produce. And as, again, what Johnny said earlier, a little bit of seasonal variation, mm-hmm. a bit of variation through our wood management and you know the casks we're filling and hopefully out of that comes a really uh you know attractive single malt at the end of the day and if it's awful we'll just re-rack it on to red wine oh that sounds a perfect way to (laughs) if it's awful you'll see the distillery for sale and you'll never hear from us again yeah no i think don't jinx yourselves i'm I'm confident (laughs) you do have quite a lot more now than you're giving yourselves credit for i I like the idea of you know being able to have the freedom to experiment um at the tasting that was hosted last night i was talking to somebody who was telling me about it's funny you mentioning yeasts was talking about how he had 
had worked at Canvas as an apprentice and I hadn't heard anybody mention before, but they were like very experimental with different yeast types. Mm. And he was saying that the way that they would experiment with it is they would bake bread. So they had a bakery on site and the employees used to come home with all these like loaves of bread that they'd made from these insane experimental, experimental breads. I mean, like I have no idea how good yeah. your bread's going to be. I'm sure there are plenty of bakers listening who are horrified by that notion. So that could have been a great output for your tea room, but I guess you guys aren't having one. So <laughs> you just have to be yeah, like feeding the birds. Sort of like a uh, yeast tasting bag of cookies or something. Kai sourdough. Yeah. I, I £8.50 a loaf, I, I minimum. Think, I think at this point we should, should say, you know, we are, I, th- I think one of our greatest strengths since the start of this has been recognising where our weaknesses are. And, you know, we have an amazing team that I just couldn't praise highly enough. Um, you know, our, our sort of lead process engineers, uh, heart process, led by a guy called Mike Billington. We have been so lucky to find them. I mean, Mike is a just... Genius. He's a, he's a, he's a genius and he loves what we're doing and he's, he's a joy to work with. Um, and our, you know, distilling consultants, sort of lead, lead consultant would be Jack Mayo, who's who's at Holyrood and Glasgow and various other wee things. Um, but, you know, Jack's just a, a polymath and similarly, you know, a joy to work with. So we're... We're super lucky, you know. We've we've got um, Gordon Grant, ex Ardmore, who used to um, run direct fire stills up there. Douglas Murray, Diageo, um, Blythe and Blythe on um, uh, civils. So, really, we we have an amazing team, and we're we're very very fortunate. So yeah, I mean, we I, Angus and I know the sort of broad brushstrokes we want to achieve, and over the years that's gone more and more and more detailed. But yeah, we we've definitely learned our support network, and we've been very very fortunate to to find the people we have. And on the flip side of that as well, the other thing about Kyth, which I think is really special and potentially even unique, is that all our shareholders are essentially just whiskey nerds. And yes, yeah, some of them have got much deeper pockets than us, but no one is a shark in it just for pure investment, you know, sort of venture capital terms. It's all people that have put in... Um, you know, meaningful, helpful amounts of money because they believe in the project and they want to see it succeed. And they've taken a look at our very detailed 16 year business plan and been like, yep, I want on board with this. And they're all people that, you know, love old style Scotch whiskey and kind of want to see a project like this, you know, flourish and and do well. And that gives me such like motivation and passion for, for what we're doing and, and kind of, a, a good bolster of confidence as well. Um, I, I am confident that you know we'll be able to do something special, um, and I think, as Johnny rightly says, we know. Like it's been a very humbling process. You know, I used to think I knew about whiskey, and then started trying to do a distillery and realise how fucking little I know about it, all this stuff, really. And a lot of the people that really truly know Scotch whiskey and understand it, and are kind of nuts and bolts right down into the the marrow, are people that you've not really heard of kind of just yeah. you know the engineers and the scientists and the people that kind of in the background a bit in the industry and we're really lucky that we've got a really broad spectrum team with a lot of different types of experience really deep experience and i think that is gonna only be more and more of an asset over the years ahead yeah and it definitely it feels like you guys have started since i first heard and you announced the project i feel like there's already we're kind of speeding towards stuff but listening to you talk there's obviously so much more to come and so much more uh learning and experimentation and hopefully lots of successes for you guys i want to do a jason style roundup to this interview although angus has kind of done a bit so i'm gonna make johnny go first um jason always likes to round out our interviews by asking what is it that has you most excited about maybe not the industry at large what's to come uh, and that'll give Angus long enough to think of something they didn't just say for, for, for the for sort of Scotch whiskey if you yeah, like yeah for the industry that you're about to kind of eventually burst onto the scene of with liquid what is it that you're looking forward about adding um, into that I don't want to lead you I think we are part of a I hesitate to use the word movement uh, Dominic Cummings over there might use it but um, secondary industry uh, well I, I, I like the fact that yeah as I say second industry but our, our peers you know people who are have built distilleries and started or are, are building um, but you know I, I see a lot of our contemporaries are as excited about you know the sort of fermentation side as we are so you know Dunfail is an obvious example they've you know already started uh, Dornach you know what they've done at sort of Dornoch One and will do at their their new distillery is going to be phenomenal as well. 
um, you know, people at uh, North Uist, uh, I'm not that sure to pronounce the one that Ewan's just gone to, is it Cabrach? Yeah, and Cabrach. Cabrach and Speyside, uh, you know, Rathsey. So, so many of these guys are doing interesting things. And I'm, you know, undoubtedly missed the people out of Hollywood, for instance, as well. And, you know, I. I don't see that as a threat at all. If anything, I see that's going to help us. You know, there's lots mm-hmm. of lots of relatively small, independent people coming out with the same message, talking about, hey, look, it's not all about wood, it's about fermentation. Of course, everyone's doing it from a slightly different angle, and I, I think Kaith are coming at it from a, a different angle again. But, you know, it's, it's part of this uh, sort of bubbling up of nerdy interest into spirit, and I think that's going to be really, really exciting in five, ten years' time. Yeah, I mean, I think we live in a... Well, we're on the cusp of uh, a bit of a golden age for Scotch whiskey. You know, we've been through uh, we've been through all sorts of stuff over the years, and you know, been through an era where quality was pretty beige and shit for a long time. Um, been through a period of massive expansion and sudden retraction, and there's lots of critical commentary about you know the number of distilleries that are starting up, and I don't. You know, doubt for a minute it's going to be hard for a lot of people and there probably will be a fair number that won't succeed but I think that there's plenty out there that you can already see who are succeeding and will succeed because they are independent and they're run by you know real people with genuine interest in quality and interesting ideas and it's quite a supportive industry and I think it's also mirrored a little bit by the world of indie bottling like Scotland's in a bit of a boom for I think you know, like yourselves, I hope Deccan Drinks is part of it as well. You know, Thompson Brothers, North Star, all these, you know, what whiskey, all these guys are, you know, modern, newish, interesting Scottish companies with run by genuine, sort of truthful, funny, awesome people. I'm really proud that, you know, we're in the mix with all that and part of it and that, you know, Kai is going to be part of that in the future. And, you know, it, it feels... Uh, it doesn't feel threatening. It feels like really exciting and something, you know, an awesome wider kind of cultural phenomenon to be part of. Yeah. I, th- I think that's kind of how I feel about being in the industry right now. It feels like we are moving in a direction which is exciting and something new. I just often, can't define what it is yet. Well, I've, I've often, I've used the phrase like secondary industry or it just doesn't really sound, it sounds a bit naff, but I think it's kind of true. You've got the big guys doing what the big guys do. And, you know, I I kind of think of that machine as this thing designed to mass market shift blended Scotch whiskey out of which rather incidentally sometimes gets spat some really good malts and produce some really good malts. I'm probably, I'm probably too harsh on them sometimes really, but, uh, but there's that blob that sits there and sort of flourishing all around it as are these much smaller... Uh, indie kooky but still you know pretty serious pretty awesome little companies indie bottlers and distilleries and which is a response to this sort of burst of uh, enthusiasm for scotch whiskey around the world and i think those are the ones that are in a stronger position to to succeed and flourish in the years ahead because you know the future for scotch whiskey at the sort of really serious million cases a year scale looks pretty tough and challenging in the decades yeah. ahead but i think that there is absolutely a community and a culture and you know customers around the world in sufficient volume to support and sustain smaller more quality focused uh, operations like us so, yeah. so essentially we want to make whiskey great again we could get that on some red baseball caps and I was going to say drink... No, no, no tea towels, but we do have, we have baseball caps. I'm not a baseball cap, kind of. Oh. Okay, well, well, we can workshop the merch at the end of this. Make Angus great again. That's, that's also a slightly you Scottish tourist board. <laughs> it brings a refreshing uh, change to MAGA. Yeah. Oh gosh, no, quick, we're losing the podcast <laughs> listeners. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you very much for telling me about Kaith. I look forward to coming back on an unofficial visit. You won't tell Not in you deepest, don't. darkest five. Uh, we will um, leave it there, but thank you very much. And thank you for these drams. Podcast listeners, you have no idea what you're missing out on. Mm. I'll well, just have to. Thank yeah. you very much for having us. You're more than welcome. Mm. Thanks so much, guys. Well, Jess. Thanks to you, thanks to Johnny, thanks to Angus for that conversation. That was brilliant to listen to, to hear. Yeah, cheers. 
you know, what, what they've got planned. And when they mentioned that old Glenmorangie and sort of targeting, you're just sort of highlighting how whiskey used to be made versus how whiskey is now currently made. I don't know. I was just drooling listening to, to you guys talk about that, that old yeah. that I was, Glenn Moe. When, when he pulled that out, I was definitely thinking of you and knowing what a soft spot you have for that kind of old style Glen Morangy. I also was a bit anxious because it was an, I think he had it in a tube for something else. And Angus is well known for being a bit of a trickster. And I was trying to look at Johnny's eye, see if he knew there was some sort of uh, mischief happening here. But yeah, the, the, that was delicious. But the obvious runaway winner, I think you can hear me talking about it, is the Glendronach from the 50s was mm-hmm. ridiculous. Yeah, I, <laughs> classic Joshua to go with the Glenmo approach. Nothing but respect there, mm-hmm. but... Yeah, R-E-S-P-C-T. those old sherry fifties. Mm. It's just so historically rich, yeah. as well as being delicious. So, yeah, the, the little green-eyed monster came out there, Jess. That was a nice <laughs> little uh, treat that you got to enjoy. No, I went and, uh, all the way to the I kingdom, celebrate the very, celebrate the very that. deepest, darkest kingdom of Fife. I needed some sort of that's sustenance. Sure, sure. Yeah. Come here. Sure. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah, and. Th- you were talking, or they were talking, about the, the mash tun being installed? Yeah, so actually since we recorded, which is a couple of weeks back, um, they've put pictures up. They've got, um, they're have got starting to build a little bit more. We talked a bit about social media. Um, Johnny's put up, I think, uh, a little bit of a write-up. Well, I suspect it's Angus and Johnny have put up photographs of the mash tun being in and being uh, kind of commissioned, put in place. So go mm-hmm. check out their, uh, the old social medias, um, and you can kind of watch it um, sort of building up slowly in uh, in real time uh, some good pictures of the inside of this um mash tun um and a nice picture of uh, aaron and johnny as well having a, a little look up at Forsyth for it too so uh yeah it's it's really real i think and that was something that i i felt like the guys were really excited about having sort of talked about it and planned it for so long it's the idea that yeah. it's now real and happening um, yep. It's pretty cool. Yep. So that'll keep them busy, I think, until um, we've got some sort of more fun pictures of like liquids and things, the real plant being commissioned towards the end of the year. So, yeah, good mm-hmm. luck to them. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Best of luck. What a yeah. what an endeavor to get involved in as a, a couple of guys that we have known for a good while now. Gosh, probably around about a decade on that front. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, best best of luck to them in their old style whiskey. <laughs> good luck. In Godspeed. (laughs) (laughs) So Jess and Jason, uh, when we started this conversation at the very beginning, at the top of the episode... Uh, we we sort of hinted at the fact that Jess will have some some pretty large global releases news, but we here in the United States of America have Oof. some of our own news to share. So much news between Jason, Jess, and Joshua, and Single Cast Nation globally speaking, that I think, and I hope you'll agree, this warrants we bring the paperboy out. From his closet. Do it. Do it. Extra, extra. We all are about a life story of Playboy Penny. Extra, extra. Extra, extra. We all about it. Me and I Playboy in trouble again. Uh, Jason, can I hand the mic over to you so you can share yes. the, the big news of the day? Get on the mic. Get, get on the mic. Just get on the mic. Get, get on, on the, the mic, mic. mic. Yeah. Yeah, so so actually, I, my news is twofold, mm-hmm. and then I will I will give the pad cost floor over to Jessica Rabbit Lomas. So to to tie up a little bit of our summer, I I was in DC mm-hmm. the other day. I was at Jack Rose Dining Saloon, mm-hmm. which is always a an honor and a treat, and and I opened my tasting by saying, if you have a chance to come to DC and listen to a Scotsman. Celebrate Bourbon Heritage Month <laughs> while pouring rye whiskey. You should absolutely do it. <laughs> and we had the best group of people in the room. And not not to throw a 
uh, uh, Joshua had an incomplete list at All you, right. but, but, but I but I have to I have to celebrate long time listeners of the podcast mm-hmm. where we've seen them in Seattle together. Mm-hmm. I've seen them in San Francisco, and I just saw them in DC. Philippe Panavong and his now wife Zapora uh-huh. were in attendance. They were in Maryland getting married the Saturday before my Monday tasting. Amazing. And they showed up without me knowing a single thing about it. <laughs> and it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant to spend time with them. Mm. Um, also had Great Nation members uh, who were back in our February historical tasting with us. Uh, Brian and Amy were there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Alex uh, was there. Uh, Alex knows who he is. I don't need to give uh, any more details there. And Brad was there. And uh, Brad uh, is a deep, deep into the pad cost as well. So oh, okay. big shout out to Brad for being in the in the room as well. It was yeah, great, great group, great tasting. The reason I bring it up in the news segment is June six was our big American launch. Still have three bottlings sitting on the website there. Wilderness Trail, Catoctin Creek and Black Button. And those were the first three bottlings that I poured at the tasting. Mm-hmm. And I made a point, and, and you and I have mentioned this uh, previously in, in another episode, Joshua, maybe even the last episode mm-hmm. with Pat Heist. When we made the selection of the Wilderness Trail, mm-hmm. we really sat with it and it really blossomed in the glass. Oh, yeah. And, and... You sometimes lose that. Jess is talking today about being at a festival, right? Mm-hmm. When you're at a festival or in a tasting, even in a masterclass, you move through pourings very quickly. Mm-hmm. And when you have an opportunity to sit and return, some casks really blossom. And so we really focused on that at the Jack Rose tasting mm-hmm. and went back and forth between Wilderness Trail and Catoctin Creek and Black Button and saw the way they evolved and changed. And it was magnificent awesome. really magnificent yeah. so had had a blast absolute blast great group of people great pours uh bill thomas was very complimentary at the end uh and very complimentary of our nation members as well hey, so yep go. way to represent the nation uh my good friends in attendance we uh also have our launch from the end of september where we return to scotch and we've got our Benevis, our Aberfeldy, our Thrusk, and our Williamson, mm. which is our unnamed South Shore Isla distillery that is neither Ardbeg nor Lagavulin. Huh. That just and maybe you'll love it. Maybe you'll hate it. You know? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I'm just asking questions. Oy, that's, so, what, that's what my... Uh, that's what my, my Uncle Morty would say. He would laugh, and then he'd say, Oig... You know, just, <laughs> oig. yeah, oig. <laughs> we can go into oig. I'm just asking questions like Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, classic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, those are those are um, beginning to ship. By the time this drops, they will be well into being shipped. My guess is we will have completed the shipments mm-hmm. uh, for those who were there on launch day. Um, and now, with this episode dropping in October. We are getting our October ducks in a row quack, quack. Uh, for another round of casks. But that will remain. Keep an eye on singlecastnation.com. Make sure you're signed up. Make sure you're on the email list. And we will let you know what the future holds. But I wish to give the floor to our dear Jessica Rabbit Lomas and Global Launch. Ooh, I feel like Joshua needs a special drum roll sort of <laughs> noise for this section. Isn't that what you, you're not hearing that? Let me turn it up just now. <laughs> oh, lo- lovely. Yeah, that's, that there was much go. better. There it was just go. not, yeah, it was yeah. too subtle. That was the problem. Uh, oh, that's, that's what it was. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, it's time to talk about some whiskeys that are not going stateside. And I, there's, uh, in the distance, just just there, I can already hear the furious typing from several of our regular correspondents <laughs> who are stateside based. Uh, who get really excited when I say things like that. Uh, yes, so we have a whole. I was trying to think of a nice plural apart from like a whole bundle of casks. Can you have a bundle of casks? 
bundle oh, makes me feel like she'll be able to rake. rake. How about a plethora? Uh, plethora. A gaggle. Oh, a gaggle. Let's do a gaggle. Yep. Is that not, is that not geese, yep. though? Dad, um, yes. Um, a murder. Pack. It's a murder. It's a murder. Oh, a murder yes. of casks. Yeah, a murder of casks. There you go. So that fits the drum roll that we just heard. That's oh, true. Yeah. Somewhat from more now sinister. On, we are only releasing our casks in murders. I love it. <laughs> I tell you, if we created a, a murder podcast, we'd really increase our listenership. <laughs> love me. Uh, my favourite my favorite genre after listening to this podcast, obviously, because it's my source of news and I found out what you two are actually doing. Uh, I listen to a lot of uh, crime podcasts. So, yeah, if we could combine whiskey and crime. Oh, man. In a responsible oh, way, obviously. If we could- yeah, if we could get hashtag a murder of casks into the show description, the episode description, this this is a game changer. We're going big time. Okay, Ask we're going viral. And you shall receive. All right, all right, Jess, <laughs> go, go ahead. Let, let's let's go down the list because I, as you go down the list too, I want to think of maybe a cask or two that we can put some liquid in glass and talk about. A oh. pour would be ideal. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind little, of getting thirsty. A little parched. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely getting thirsty. It, it's nice that we're discussing things, but I've got some glasses in front of me. I've got some uh, bottles that I can crack in front of me. Okay, so you want a little Joshua Hatton incomplete list, and then we're going to do some little stop-offs and drink things. Okay, so in no particular Please. no particular order, I think. Because uh, okay. uh, I feel like that... That's how this is going to work. So uh, we've definitely got a Glen Geary, 21-year-old, in uh, oh. First Fill Bourbon, Hogshead. Yum, yum. It's, uh, it's funny that you're not an up-talker, and yet you just said Glen Geary with a question mark at the end. So it's a like bit of mystery. Could be a Glen Geary, could be a Glen Geary. <laughs> oh. Easy, Jess, easy. Look, I know. <clears throat> Moving on. Much Call better whiskey that. HR. Don't, don't worry, I'm uh, fully self-policing on that. Uh, so we've got Glen Geary. We also have an Aberfeldy, which is in Second Fill Bourbon, uh, which mm-hmm. again, like so those first two, kind of unusual. We don't see a whole heap of those as nice um, individually uh, released single casks. I just forgot the word single cask. That's great, as I'm looking at a bottle with single cask nation <laughs> written on it. <laughs> uh, bringing a little kind of fun, a little journey, because obviously we're at the end of the year. And when I pour for people and say, what is it you want to drink? They all say, Jess, stop stop with the exciting casks. All we want is fifth fill, very slow maturation. No, no, no. Uh, we've got, got a Binahaven Stosha. So here we've mm. got uh, our first um, bit of Isla happening. And that's in mm. refill PX Hogshead. So a bit of sherry, Oofty. bit of smoke, bit of leave this in the market so I can go buy some. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, I've already informed my family they're not getting any Christmas presents so I've already mentally spent all of the whiskey money um, <laughs> I've got a uh, Balmenech so this I feel like a distillery mm. Jason has started mentioning literally all of the time thank you Jess uh, thank you. I feel seen thank I you feel like, I don't know when you were here I feel like we drank quite a lot of it in Glasgow you were really we did. vibing Balmenech which is a tribe I have yet to see assigned in the whiskey world so perhaps you could start that it's a little eleven-year-old. Yeah, mm-hmm. can can I tell you what kicked it off for me? I, yeah. I, I may have mentioned it during twenty twenty-four or or not, but when we were all in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in Scotland in January, and Scotch Malt Whiskey Society had just put out their warm Reekin Rich and just delicious, delightful, and I kept reaching for that at the venues. Mm-hmm. That put Balmenic front and centre on my mind mm. to look for. And now, anybody who's come over to visit me, the first thing I have poured for them is that Balmenic. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm on a kick of my own. Like, listen, listen, you meet nation members, they're talking about Dal Ewan freely. They're talking about Inchgower freely. We got to keep that train moving along the tracks. Mm-hmm. The current Athrusk that I just mentioned on the website is an old style, old school style of whiskey. I want people to be mentioning Athrusk. Balmenach, I really want as well. And there's going to be one in 25 that we're going to be mentioning a whole lot more as I 
take a cheeky look at your list to see if you're about to say it. I don't think you look, are. Look at this guy, honestly. And it's Spo- a spoilers are front centre. <gasps> Balmenic right. worm tubs. Balmenic is a worm tub. Yep. That you've got to, you've got to stop invoking worm tubs. People are like visibly angry now if you bring I it know. up in front of them. I know. Yeah. Hush. Uh, okay. What's G- give me a second? I need to grab my shoes from the door. It just started bucketing down. But please continue. Just if you're my chair, dear listener, that's what I'm doing. I thought that was a real euphemism there. I thought, just getting my shoes from the door. <laughs> yeah, sure you are, Jason. <laughs> Wink. Um. What should we have next? Oh, are, are you thirsty? I'm thirsty. Let's have our first stop at a, a thing to drink. Ah, okay. Reach, well, reach, what are we drinking? Glass. Um, so the next, and I feel like we can have a little chat about it for a while. Um, I've got a bottle here, which is called Black's Boat Bridge. <gasps> Black's Ooh. Boat Bridge. Ooh, oh, listeners yes. of the podcast, what does that mean? Mm. And this is what I was calling a fresh crack, which is going to fail me massively because our beautiful bottles, which I adore... You have to fill in your own sound effect. <laughs> That's the best I can do. Okay. Right, let me see if I can record some audio here. That didn't work. <laughs> yeah, so... so you want me to go back and get my shoes again? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. So Black's Boat Bridge. So this is... I'm trying to think how many how many distilleries you mentioned so far. You mentioned the Aberfeldy. You mentioned the Belmenach. Yep. Now we're talking the Black Boat Bridge. Yeah, and we've had a Glengarry, oh, and we've had a Stoja. Oh, Glengarry and the Stoja. And what's the cask on this? Uh, so, <clears throat> um, it is full first, first fill split oak. So, for those of you who are unaware with abbreviations, what they mean that's a split oak is a Spanish oak, Oloroso mm. Hogshead brackets five years because we are not messing around with finishes here. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, it's a June 2011 distillation. I nearly said distribution. Distribution. Um, and it's we've bottled it as a 13-year-old as a nice and chunky 58.4%. Mm-hmm. And the That's cask, a good age on that. It's cask ID protein. number? Uh, cask ID number, for those who are writing this down on your bingo sheet, uh, 152770. Can you go. taste was- that? Oh yes, I had that on my sheet. Oh, look at the, look at the color on this liquid. It's just so rich, so dark. I am shouting at you from myself in the future as I'm driving the car, listening to you say, <laughs> "Look at the color on this whiskey." <laughs> but let's talk about the color we've assigned to it, Jason. Yes, do you good, remember? Good save. Do, do you remember the color we assigned to it, Jess or, or Jason? Color assigned. Let's let's jump in with two feet. Oh, burnt it, ochre. Mm. Nice. That fits. Right. It absolutely fits. fits. There's no doubt about that. So this is not my my favorite. I wonder if we're going to get to a, a Johnston yelling color, which is my favorite, which is a burnished copper. Mm. That's not what this is. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think this is really fun. I'm going to have a little nose and maybe you two could explain to the dear listeners what on earth Black Spoke Bridge is all about. Huh. Yeah. So, one of the things to our mind is if if you're unable to use a distillery name, and obviously we're always looking to use a distillery name when able, but when unable, we go on the old Google Maps or the Apple Maps, your mileage may vary. You may pull out a a double A, an AA roadmap of the United Kingdom, which we had in our car growing up in Ayrshire. I am an ordnance survey map trips. or death. That's your t- ordnance survey, right. or you get lost. That's, I can't. No other maps right. acceptable. And so you, but perfect, perfect. So you, so you call up the distillery that shall not be named, and you start looking for obvious landmarks roundabout, so that when people put it in the Google machine, they go, ah, Stones of Stenness is a very popular. Uh, unnamed distillery in single cast nation circles. Uh, see what I did there? And if you go to <laughs> the Google machine and put in stones of Stenness, you will see a standing stone circle between two distilleries, Scapa and Island Park. And we have famously said it is not Scapa. And so when you then look up Black Spot Bridge, it is somewhat equidistant between Crag and Moore and Glen Farkless. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh. <laughs> 
and one of them is more litigious than the other. And I'm not going to say which one this is. <laughs> Chicken. <laughs> but what's nice about this? What's nice about this bridge? Is it is it, it crosses the River Spey, right? So it, it really puts beat. a little sense of place there for for people. So I think once you nose it, and once you, of course, <laughs> taste it, you realize, okay, it's, it's it's not the other one; it's the other one. <laughs> mm, it's not the 100%. other one. Hundred percent. It's the other one. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Very good. <laughs> All right. So. I mean, off <laughs> off the bat for me, it's just like crush nuts. Go easy, Jason. Boy. Like uh, you know, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> like toffee and Brazil nuts, and just like all of the dark things, melted milk chocolate going on in there. Mm. Mm. It's a bit of a. I would call it a lip smacker. Oh right! Oh, you're onto the taste already. I haven't even. Yeah, you guys were talking for ages. I got thirsty. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, here we go. We spent ten minutes on burnt ochre. Yeah, well, it's also I got anxious <laughs> at the idea of uh, litigation, so I just thought I'd. Uh... <laughs> yeah, and also very correct. We, very we, correct. There's there's also a really fruity note going on here, like almost like a a overripe peach kind of note on the nose, which I which I kind of like. Like take that peach and soak it in some rum. And now we're talking. Well, I I want to throw in one for our friends in the UK, and I, and I don't have don't know how far travelled this note is, but cola cubes. Mm. And I would imagine we've got European friends, international friends who come to Scotland and make sure they buy a poke of cola cubes. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that on the nose, and I absolutely love that mm. note. I, uh, I cola cubes, Jess. I like it Where in whiskey. I like them in whiskey, but I really don't okay. like them as a sweet. Don't really know why. I'm not really into cola flavored anything. Like when you have a Haribo, the cola oh, okay. bottles were always the one I would trade my brother for fried eggs because they're oh. clearly the superior oh, option. Interesting, interesting. Uh, but oh. yeah, I don't, I don't really know why. Um, it definitely it's, it's in the nose here, but I enjoy it in the form of whiskey. So uh, there's no um, issues with that here. Um, definitely, I think it's it's really ma it's my first whiskey of the day, listeners of the podcast. Uh, and sometimes people find that hard to believe that I wait until late into the afternoon before I lay into the drams. Um, but it's really making my mouth water. It's really like uh, rich, and it's kind of hanging onto your teeth. I often talk about grippy whiskey. It's really mm -hmm. set in in the way that you would do if you have a, a treacle sponge or a bit like. Um, Ooh, do you have an America like Jamaica cake? Do you know what I mean, Jason? The ones that my mum would give us. There's oh, like I a, love Jamaica cake. There's a treacle sponge yeah, it's like one. Yeah, a heavy a, golden. Yeah, and a golden yeah, syrup. A heavy one. golden syrup sponge. Yeah. Ooh. Although d denser than a sponge, it's kind of on its way towards malt loaf kind of consistency. Ah, oh, I like this. Yeah, now really. Oh, it's cake. cracking. Okay, really I'm, I'm going to get you some for when you next come over because it's magical. Mm. And if you slice it on the uh, pretense that you're only going to have one little bit <laughs> uh, and warm it up and put some uh, and it has to be no other no other things except it has to be um bird's eye custard or ambrosia from a can oh, always from a can yeah. never from a you can get them at plastic tubs now which i think is cheating but when i was when i was younger oh, it was custard in a can and so like this is very yeah, i knew you were going custard on that one it's the only thing to accompany it with and what we used to fight over, it's this little tiny loaf cake that's kind of, I don't know, uh, like not much longer than your hand. And it's in a like a paper wrapper, the same way as when you would bake at home. But all the okay. kind of like squidgy bits from the wrapper stay on the wrapper. So when you sliced mm -hmm. it, even if you were only allowed one stupid slice, you were permitted to <laughs> scrape all the sticky bits off the edge. Yes. That didn't count as having another slice. So you, oh. me and my brother would be there with the, like, the knife kind of peeling away all we could before we were told to put it back in the tin, you've had your one slice. Uh, my and sometimes the paper would rip and then you'd be stuck. Like, yeah. you've got the squidgy yeah. bit, but it's also got a bit of paper on yeah. it. Guess what? You eat the paper. It's coming with you. No. Fiber, but honestly... Right? Fiber in your diet. But yeah, it's, um, it's probably got more nutritional value than the rest of the cake. But, uh, yeah, if my mum could hear this, because she doesn't know what a podcast is, unbelievably, um, she would be very annoyed that I'm making it sound like we had a really abusive childhood. We weren't. She was just very strict about cake. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, uh, I've got a lot of that happening here. This is lovely, and it it lasts. So all this time that we've been wittering about Jamaican cake, um, I've still got a bit of that kind of warming, uh, chewy sherryness happening in here, um, which is definitely the casket work. But I, I think it's lovely. It's got a little bit of kind of saltiness at the end. It's just a little little zing to stop it being too sweet. I think. See, I'm I'm focused on the on the fruit cake bit. Like that was a guilty pleasure as a young Jewish boy growing up having a Christmas fruitcake. You sneak it, you sneak it under the Hanukkah bush, and you, you give it a wee taste. Uh, yeah, it's just a, such a rich, rich whiskey. That's so you know, cute because the bit in my household when somebody brought around, you know, like when your auntie or your granny had made like fruitcake as kids, it was a fruitcake we would hand back to my mum, but we would have peeled the marzipan and the icing and eaten that bit. Oh, the cake. It's, only as, it's only as I've got older that I've discovered the magic of good fruit cake. It was always the marzipan and the icing for us. Love it. You need so, yeah. to discover yeah, the magic fruit cake. of bad fruit cake, Jess. No, I don't. Awesome. Mm, okay. I think that's really what put me off to start with. Uh, right, like dry with horrible fruit in it that's not soaked long enough. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like fruit cake is a very British, and then people that who have been to the UK tasting note. Um, in the same way that when we get towards that time of the year, uh, we start talking about things like uh, mince pies. Um, I did a tasting last year with a whole bunch of friends that we do every year. We send out, um, we do like a deconstruction of a distillery and we'll look at all their different cask types. So we did Kilhoman last year and we did um, PX, we had a Fino, um, some Madeira. So we were basically trying the bottles of that distillery and then trying it alongside a PX wine, trying it with some Madeira, trying it with... And it, when nice. it's Christmas, yeah. I always do like a kind of suggested um, shopping list to go with the drams. But, you know, always with a note of feel free to riff on it and uh, do as you like. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for this distillery, a yeah, little mince pie here would be delicious. But I hadn't really thought about the fact that we had an incredibly international audience. And so we were discussing mince pies and my lovely Finnish friend was like, this sounds disgusting. Why are you putting cream on a meat pie? And it was only at that point I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, mince meat is not always finely minced animal product it's also this slightly weird syrupy fruit mixed with suet and then you put it in a pie you're right that is weird now i've said it out loud so but all those kind of to me very christmasy very oh i said the word oh no uh very seasonal spicy is type thing this this drum is going to be absolutely perfect for that yeah mince go. pie 100%. brackets non mince pie close brackets all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what else do we have? What, what else is going okay, on? What else is on my list? Um, release. So we've also got a really, and I'm excited because it's a longtime favorite of mine. I've got a Glen Murray 10 year old, which is also in second fill PX uh, hogsheads. Mm -hmm. which is going to be a smashing little number. I think it's going to be a real have we, winner. That Have we done a global Glen Murray before or is this our first no, it's global the first, Murray, first yes. global Glen Murray. That's quite hard to say. First global yeah. Glen Murray. <laughs> blip, 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 blip. Um, so that's really exciting because I am a big fan. That is. And uh, it's delicious. I'm just going to switch around my things under here. What else have we got? Uh, we have got... Uh, I thought, we, uh, okay, we're going to go with this one next. So I'm going to go for our next tasting whiskey. So excuse the clanking, Ooh. dear listeners Good of the Padcost. All whilst right. I try not to drop whiskey all over the table. Yeah, uh, I know next, which sample bottle I'm opening. Next up, for our next fresh crack, we have got um, a whiskey that I have... I'm going to be honest, listeners, I have rarely heard these two be so excited about a whiskey. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know where we're going. I know where we're going. <laughs> you know when you're, you're a kid in the Guilty. supermarket and you really want some sweets or something, and the whole way around the shop here to your mum... Oh, I'm just so I'm so hungry. Do you know a little? Yeah, just just a little, just a little. Some just. A, why do we? Mm -hmm. Can I have a little? Yeah, just a, mm -hmm. The whole way around, like chitter chatter. When we started talking about the lineup for this outturn, these two were that exact small child. Like, oh, there's a. Oh, we could have a. Wouldn't that be? So, um, this drum I'm about to announce is a Tobamori, and it's a 16 year old, and it has been in a refill French oak barrique for three years. It's a 2008 distillate. And it's 55.7%. And I'm going to start with the three words. So on our nice new labels, we have a three words or a truncated tasting note that we put over the top mm. by our 
Slavometer. Let me tell you, the Germans think that word is hilarious. Uh, (laughs) So our three words here, our what three words, are coastal, grassy, and rewarding. And I'm going to, while I do this little fresh crack, which... But I'll do a pour. You can have a glug while I pour it in a glass, right? Just... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, look at the sound of that. And so, just to be clear, for for our listeners, you mentioned Tobermory. I did. Now, usually, and when I say usually, I mean the only time we've ever bottled Tobermory Mm -hmm. is when it's been peated, and therefore we call it Lichig. Are we calling this one Lichig? We are not. not. Unpeated Tobermory. So it's Tobermory. (laughs) This is the other side of the distillery. The unpeated one. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, and uh, if you don't have the distillation date in front of you, Jess, this is two days before my 2008 birthday and four Mm -hmm. days before yours. Well, that's nice. So for the listeners, this is the 25th of June, 2008. Where were you on the 25th of June, 2008? Uh, Recovering Uh, from the 27th of June, 2004. ah, I was in Washington, D.C. with Delma and Mimi in Haida's belly, uterus to be (laughs) exact. Uh, enjoying, enjoying the sex. <laughs> Hashtag walk. <laughs> well, this turned into a discussion I was not anticipating. I was just going to say that I was in Aberdeen, uh, drinking whiskey in mine and Jason's former alma mater. But okay, yeah, there sure. There you go. Love it. Look at that. Fetus update. Very, that's, is that our first one of the podcast? I think so. Okay, so um, <laughs> what colour on the old... Uh, yes. Yes. Dulux Watcheroo. Oh, this color is, on this is tremendous. This is a good one. I feel like the listeners are going to enjoy this as they're in their cars. Strap in. <laughs> Paging HR. I said in. Uh, the color on this, I think we should start putting these on the label so people can enjoy my frustration at our naming conventions for colors of whiskey. <laughs> um, dear listener, we have gone for yellow topaz. That's perfect. Isn't that so great? Isn't that the best color descriptor ever? I feel like the assigned to a whiskey. The jewelers who are also listeners to the podcast are going to be delighted. (laughs) (laughs) We've really been Ah, neglecting them as a category of listener. And they're like, they're like, they could have mentioned citrine, but they went with yellow topaz. Bless them, bless them. I think that's because topaz is nicer than citrine, but. Uh, all right. Topaz is green. What did you just say? No, I think it's nicer than citrine as a gemstone. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, I'm uh, so far out of my depth. I have literally nothing to offer. All right, all right. What, but the nose on this, luckily, is beguiling. <sighs> beguiling. It's, Why is that not uh, one of the three words? Because <laughs> we, we used that word in another one. <laughs> 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 but but I re- I remember when we first wrote the notes on this. And Jess, when you were going to mention, you know, X number of words, I thought you were going to go with what our official tasting notes say, which starts off with breakfast in a glass, right? That's, that's a strong, breakfast. that's a strong start. There's also, um, I feel like you two were having far too much fun when you came up with these notes. So this is, sometimes when I read back our tasting notes, I can see the ones that I have had more of an influence in, and I can see the ones where one or both of you is really just taking it and run with it so you've mentioned the nose on here begins with breakfast in a glass but i'm gonna skip mm-hmm. ahead even though i haven't sipped it yet and we've All got right. for the palette here you two have written redolent of the coast with wet sand dunes <laughs> oh, it, but it's but you gotta keep going oh, That's only oh you the want more of, of the coast okay mm-hmm. wet sand dunes yeah. marum grass and a hint of salt in the air but note two freshly soaked barley dry hay yellow rhubarb and a gentle vanilla sponge sweetness yeah, I, for the listeners, like sometimes you'll have it where a whiskey just puts you in a moment. Mm-hmm. And for me on tasting this, it put me not on the beach at air, but it put me on the patch between the car park and the beach, where it's a bit sandy underfoot. 
It's clearly been raining because it's air mm. on the Ayrshire coast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you've got that wet sand, but then you've got that very dry, very rigid grass. That hurts that is when you're walking giving you an experience. Be, right, right. You're kind of walking around it, in between it, and I thought the grass was was so present. And then you're at the coast, so there's a bit of salt in the air. Tasting this was that exact moment in time, and I, yeah, you know, I haven't done that in a few years, but it really always takes you back to being a kid, doing that as, as a kid, and just hoping the sun would come through all the cloud cover, and it never did. I've never had such a delightful uh, coast beach experience. That would uh, this, I was I would venture this is far more pleasant than an Asia Coast beach experience, but I don't want the entire <laughs> coast beautiful, West Coast coming beautiful. for me. Yeah, I'm saying nothing about Yorkshire right now. In retaliation, I'm taking the high ground, Jess. Okay, well, you do that. Uh, shall I? Our f- just as a, a final flourish of the flamboyancy of your writing here for our finish. It is really long, actually, as I'm talking, but. Uh, long with lingering saltiness, barley sugar, and wait for it, a beguiling mm. minerality. Bye. There you go. There's your beguiling. There you go. It's in there. Oh, you do guys. You, but here's the here's the serious part of that. Do do you get that minerality in the finish? Yeah, I do, and uh, definitely that kind of lingering saltiness is there. And I definitely agree with the rhubarb in the palate. That's kind of like it switches for me between that kind of like maltiness, but also that uh, like tartness of rhubarb. Absolutely, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's so that funny, tartness, right? Yeah. I really want it to make me feel like I'm on Mull. When I went to, the weekend, I went to Mull was extremely wet, like awful wet. Everybody was just wet and grumpy the whole time. So maybe that was a bit too wet for it to feel like this. But maybe I'll, I should take the bottle back, go back to Mull, and there you have go. a little plodder yeah. on Tobermory with it. Yep. Yep. Yeah, just a gentle mur. Yeah. In the air. We'll, we'll maybe capture this whiskey for you. Not with a Y. Uh, not Murray. And not... No. <laughs> so I said about my brother on Mull, the better. <laughs> Although, hey, look, I'm, sh- I'm, I'm showing this to the camera again. Yeah. I am showing the Lechig Glen Cairn yeah. that my brother and his wife brought me from their trip to the Tobermory distillery. Perfect. Two on non-whiskey Mull. drinkers went to Mull and got you some whiskey shit. See, that's it. See when your brother and his wife tell you, oh, we're at Tobermory, we got you a wee something. Like, ooh, ooh, rubbing hands with glee. Oh, I wonder what they selected for me. I know they've got a hand fill in the distillery. Oh, I wonder what it is. Don't tell me what it is. I'll see it when I see you. Uh, branded Glencairn glass and a coaster is very kind. Never look a gift horse in the mouth, they say. Yeah. Never, never. Gosh, you can't drink it. You can only drink from it. I was getting quickly, quickly into the dangerous territory of ungracious little shit. That's that's where when you were like, <laughs> oh, I got anxious for a minute there. Oh, I'll take another sitting sip. right next to me at my desk. I look at my glass every day and I think of my brother and his wife not buying me whiskey at the Supermore <laughs> Distillery. Full marks to you, Murray. Well done. Oh, brilliant. Uh, oh, I'm so glad we poured this one. It's so nice to have it back in the glass. It's a real, um, oh. it's a real contrast to our Black Spoke Bridge um, to kind of go between the Very two. Much so mm-hmm. it's fun. Yep. So, yep. did we did we say that? And I'm I'm sorry, I was so excited about sampling this again. Did we mention the Tobermory cask? We did. Oh, but and I shall the cask repeat. ID and like you know, there's people uh, inquiring minds want to know. Inquiring minds, please write with a stamped address envelope. Um, so we had that it was a refill French oak barrique for three years. We did not have cask ID for those people who are mm. collecting the old numbers mm. game. Uh, it's one nine two four five zero. So now you can fully enjoy that dram, knowing that number exists in oh, your mind. You can taste each number. Yeah, it's delicious. Difference maker. Absolutely, that is just cracking. That's mm-hmm. you know, it's it, you, we always get into that position where. They're all your children and you don't want to pick a favourite and you don't want to make any of them feel bad about themselves. Yada, yada, yada. The, the Tobermory for me is is just wow. Yeah. Like I, I keep returning. And I've said this in tastings, I've said it on the podcast, is when we go from selecting to bottling and having access to our own bottles, purchasing on the open market like everybody else, I 
judge a whiskey by how often have I gone back to that sample? Mm -hmm. This Tobermory is the one that I've been the other day. Like, I should pour some of that Tobermory. I should pour some of that Tobermory. Just phenomenal. Really phenomenal. And I say that as somebody on the other side of that distillery. Le chig, le chig, le chig. Listeners know that about me. Tobermory, boom. Our first unpeated Tobermory for the nation. And Jess gets it for global markets. Bam. Bam. Uh, All right. Yeah. Well, I already have a... My, uh, I have an un- well, I have two uncles that love whiskey, and I have uh, one who lives uh, up here in Scotland, and he is a massive Tobermory fan. So maybe, maybe this is his oh, Christmas man. present sorted. Even though I just told all of the podcast listeners, none of my family are getting Christmas presents. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you think he'd mind if I sent him a bottle of it with just like a generous dram for me taken out of it? You know, know what I would do? He wouldn't know, right? I would get him Not on the slightest. I would get get him a Tobermory glass. That's what I would do. Oh, that's a good idea. Right? They're crowd pleasers. I just, I'm just looking at it again. Sorry, I couldn't. Couldn't resist. I couldn't not couldn't, look couldn't at help it. yourself. No. All right. Uh, okay. So, so listen. Um, we've got what two more whiskeys one more. within the one, one more. One more. Are we going to pour this one more? Uh, yes, we are. For reasons that are about to become extremely apparent. So hang on. I'm, I'm going back to the old desk shuffle, listeners. Uh, <laughs> Shuffle noise, I'm going to noise, I'm gonna have to ask noise. Santa if there's money in the budget for me to have an entire sound recording studio, and I wouldn't have to do this awkward shuffle Uh Okay, so another fresh crack, and then... Fresh crack. <laughs> I was about to pull that all over the microphone. <laughs> I haven't said that since the 80s. <laughs> fresh crack. <laughs> pull that all over the microphone, that's not a good start. But the rest yep. of this recording is done underwater. Do crack. But, but, I, but when I do, I make sure it's fresh. Uh, well, I don't always do... Orcs. Isn't that what the orcs said when they were taking the hobbits to Mordor and they had to take a break? And they said, what about that crack? That's fresh. No? Okay. All right. I'm going to edit that one out. <coughs> no, Sorry. no. You should leave that in. And I get abuse for my appalling accents. My orcish accent is terrible. It really <laughs> is. I want the sound of... I want the sound of tumbleweed just, to be entered in there. Just like some Siberian wind sound effect. Done. <laughs> and then crickets. Um, I don't always do... And then crickets. Um, I don't always do crack, but when I do, it is always 12 days older than I am. <sighs> oh, so maybe not so fresh. Not so fresh. I didn't know where that was going. <laughs> So f- How dare you You're insinuating Oh my sorry age. I didn't know you heard that <laughs> joke All Good right, grief go. uh, So our final stop On the global release uh, mm-hmm. Outturn list Is uh, We have gone um, Off piste slightly We are on a grain whiskey mm-hmm. So anybody who knows Single cast nation uh, And that we're kind of a bit Fan Fan Boys and girls For <laughs> Invergordon. This is not an Invergordon. Hashtag walk. Uh, this has gone, we've gone all the way back to the kingdom of Fife here. Uh, this is from a grain distillery which is shuttered, as some people like to say. Uh, this is from the Cambus distillery. And this is a 35 year old that has been in First Fill STR Barriques for three years. Mm-hmm. That all important cask ID number. Is 150606, not 601, 606. Uh-huh, and six, this six. this was distilled an entire, what did I just say, 17 days before I, 17, yep. before I shuffled onto this mortal coil in uh, June of 1989. It was a heatwave summer. Nobody in Scotland had any water. Uh, and uh, it was, yeah, just absolutely roasting. Wow. And I was in Derby in Englandshire that year. Apologies. Uh, I was also in Nottingham that summer. And uh, we did a canal boat trip. So you were on the verge of being born. And I was on a canal boat as a 15-year-old. Oh. As a soon-to-be 15. And I was in beautiful Naugata, Connecticut. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> watching the flames on the lake like you were in hell <laughs> cooking three eyed fish on the fire it was fantastic <laughs> <laughs> 
But you turned out all right. Yeah, turned out all left. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, we've got on now. See, hey, you. We have decided this is a bright copper. Yes, not a burnished yeah. or a sanguine. Not burnished. Yeah, not not dark enough for burnished. But it's got good. But good, it is bright. It's it's like a sparkly, sparkly bright, like a deep brightness. Mm. Right? It's like if plastic the, silverware. If the Tobermory was beguiling. I think this is intriguing. Ooh. That's really tasty. I, I know we, like you said this in your intro, Jess, like we we love grain around here. Mm-hmm. I'm hesitant to call this old grain since you've talked about how close <laughs> it is to your day of birth. I am old, it's um, fine. <laughs> but, but 35 years on this is, that's, that's a good age. Mm-hmm. I would say so, obviously. <laughs> Um, I'm treading so carefully. <laughs> I love it. I'm really excited for this to be um, this number to be even older than I am. Um, mm. It's got a kind of ginger nutty nuts. Now I have uh, just mm. swallowed that. Mm-hmm. It's like um, like a ginger nut biscuit. Is that a thing in America mm-hmm. land? Do you have ginger nut biscuits? Yeah, yeah. And they're yeah, yeah. Do we? Bit- yeah, Moscow Jim makes some cracking. So ging- ging- just grab a ginger nut. What's a ginger nut? Is it like a ginger snap with nuts in it, or mm, they're a bit ginger. thicker no, than that? No, there's no nuts. There's, yeah, it's it's a complete no misnomer. There's no nut in it whatsoever. Uh, and they're so they're <laughs> a ginger. I would call them like ginger snaps, like the Swedes, like the Nordics have yeah, pepper okay. But it's right, yeah. what I'm thinking of is like thicker than that. It's like kind of the width of your little finger, and they're lethal. You can't put them in a tub with anything else because then everything tastes of ginger. Ah, oh, there you go. Yeah, I get the so get good. The but g- even a little bit of molasses will be mm. in there as well. Yeah. Like that nice Ooh, kind of nice. heavy dark treacle for international listeners. Mm. Can, can I ask a, a, a question of you two uh, British folk? Mm-hmm. In our official tasting notes, and, and Jason... You had mentioned what this was to me before, but we selected this a while ago, and and memory is what memory does. It goes away sometimes. So in our notes, we say words, 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 and even... That sounds like us. (laughs) And even (laughs) Kranachan sprinkled with chili flakes. Mm, Yes. So Kranachan. So our overseas listeners are loving this because they know what, we're, what you're talking yeah. about. But for the Americans... What, and what even even the people in Scotland are furious now at the idea that we've allowed Americans to put chili flakes in Kranachan. Although I think that might work, you know. Don't lynch me. Uh, that's exactly... Exactly. It would work. So Kranachan. fill in the gaps, Jess. Kranachan is a um, traditional Scottish dessert. Um, and in classic all things Scottish, it contains a healthy amount of uh, fats in the form of sugar and cream. Delicious, delicious, mm-hmm. heavy cream. Mm-hmm. Uh, and raspberries and a bit of oats uh, and it's one of these desserts that's quite hard to make it look beautiful um, but yeah, it's usually it's like an eaten mess yeah, in presentation it um, basically <laughs> relies on you having a, some sort of fancy glassware to present it in uh, quite often you'll get oh. like a couple of raspberries bunged on the top of it as well whole raspberries mm-hmm. for presentation for the old gram uh, and then, um, depending whose house you're in, um, <laughs> my granny would probably have put still warm out of the oven shortbread on the side of it it's been like rolled in oh, caster sugar. Oh, mm. oh, uh, bless her. So uh, deep apologies to any diabetics listening to this podcast. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's what Kranachan is. It's fairly heavy. Uh, the whole dessert is cold. You can make it and put it in the fridge and then eat it later. Or just eat it out of the jug with a spoon or your fingers. Um, <laughs> uh, I like the idea of chili flakes on the top of it, actually, because it would give it like a little kick. You know, like dark chocolate with chili on it is really good. 100%, yeah. yeah. So I, th- I think that would be nice of this. We've also, um, we've got a little line here about buttered digestive biscuits. Mm. Uh, mm. I used to make those for my dad when we were watching the Masters tournament. Right. And uh, it would be a digestive biscuit, then with the butter, and then I would put some cheddar cheese on top of that. Mm. And uh, but even just a digestive with butter on it, oofty. That's a rewarding experience. Like real, real salted butter, kind of real to spread it. Like real salted butter is what in, we're talking about. In our house, it would have been all olive oil based mm. uh, spread, but you can imagine it being better with butter. Yeah, that's that's what I was asking because I grew up in a household with yeah. where butter was oof, extremely forbidden. 
even at Christmas. Same. Uh, we grew up yeah, with the same. Vitalite. I think that's what it was called. It was in like a tub. I remember. Yeah, ours was Olivo. Oh, yeah, that's posh. It's posh. Yeah. The olive oh, oil really? one's posh. Oh, yeah, gosh. we just had regular person margarine. Flora? Yeah. Flora or Flora? like some sort of light margarine, which I guess now in Woke 2024, we would have to call like a vegan spread or something. Because it's plant based, plant based, plant plant based. Set me up for life. Yeah, Uh, made from real vegans. Ah, but see, now I've discovered butter. God, it is like crack. It's amazing. Um, (laughs) But yes, very difficult to spread on a digestive biscuit. You may snap it. There may be accidents. You get it in your whiskey as you crumbled it everywhere. Terrible disaster. So, on this occasion, I will permit some sort of olive oil based spread on your digestive biscuit. (laughs) But leave me the crack. It speaks to the text. It speaks to the texture of this. Uh, canvas right which is it has a heavy mouthfeel mm-hmm. like i think that time in str has made a different a difference to the experience here like it is very hashtag drink the whole bottle responsibly um it's very much in that world i think it's yeah, it's I've... quite classic so i was gonna say it's quite classic of the style of canvas i because i think invergordon has a lot of the um sort of more um like window putty sort of more slightly acetony notes that happen to it um and i always think canvas doesn't have that it's a much heavier richer oilier yes. spirit yeah yeah yep. um mm-hmm. not that i've drunk hundreds of canvases but i would say probably the half dozen or so that i have drunk i always find it that kind of like rich cream almost creamier i think on the palate than an invergordon is um yeah sort of really Mm. yummy and that, it hangs around for a bit and i definitely think that's also helped by the str cask uh has definitely added a sort of longevity in the uh palette for me and, yep. and that's exactly what i was going to say that this str cask is bringing things to canvas that you don't normally taste it sort of builds on what canvas does yeah and and i love that sort of like fruitiness that it adds to it and the, but then there's this the sort of more warming notes you talked about the digestives like for me it's like warm oats right just really comforting yep. yet sweet and indulgent mm-hmm. and yeah it's just all the things yeah, yeah. yeah that's going to do really really well once people know what it is and where it is mm-hmm. yeah definitely it's um it's lovely was there not um i feel like we did review a canvas mm-hmm. was there not part of the macbeth whiskeys there was a canvas there wasn't there I seem it to was a 31 year old. Yep. Or a 31 or 33. One of those. Yeah. What a delicious treat that Excellent. was. Mm-hmm. And I think this is kind of, yeah, building on that. It's lovely. The STR, for those people, I know some people who are a little bit skeptical of STR. I think if you're worried about that, hmm. the finish and effect of the STR here is uh, complementary rather than striking. Um, I, I think it's done a really nice job of kind of boosting that texture a little bit and making it yeah. even longer I think it lasting. Brings a berry. Yeah, a berry sweetness to the equation as well. Hence the, the Kranaken with the raspberries. Yeah. Definitely, exactly. That's why the Kranaken is the dessert of choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah pomegranate is good. Brilliant though. selections, Jess. Really, Thanks. really excellent. Uh, an excellent murder of casks <laughs> for the global market. Yes. A murder of casks. I'm, I'm really excited <laughs> about getting these out, pouring them in tastings. I'm definitely going to be trialing some of them at uh, Glasgow's Whiskey Festival in November. Um. Mm. I am looking forward to running a few tastings and getting it out to people, being in stores and pouring. Um, it's a really nice mixture here. I, I think we've done ourselves proud, if I may say so myself. Uh, there's a nice mixture oh, of casks here. So we have bourbon for people who are looking for kind of, you know, bourbon maturation. We've got some funkier numbers here with this STR and the Tobomori's uh, French Oak Barriques. Um, of course, we have some classic sherry numbers because it's that time of year and people want sherry um, to warm them through the winter months um Mm -hmm. and i I think so i think we've got a nice kind of play here of everything so uh and also some ages and i'm hoping that um i'm not going to put uh prices on things but there's a a couple of really good um little drinking numbers in here that i think people will be very happy to grab in multiples Mm -hmm. uh to either gift or have in their uh drinking collections yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, just, I'm looking, just looking over it. First, first Tober Mori, first Glen Murray, yeah. uh, first Black Spot Bridge for your global market. Mm-hmm. First and Canvas. First Stoucher. And Canvas. First, first canvas, canvas for there, global yeah. market. So a whole bunch um, there. Some nice firsts in there. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Cheers, Jess. Yeah, thanks. I'm uh, I'm now sat with three glasses of whiskey in front of me, so thank <laughs> you guys for an excuse to come here and educationally discuss them with you and the podcast listeners. And now it'd be very rude to put them back in the bowl, so I'm going to have to drink them all. What a shame. Yeah, I've, I've got three empty glasses in front of me. <laughs> Same. Last bit of news before we get out of here. Speaking of coming there, one thing that I wanted to mention, Jess, you'd mentioned Glasgow's Whiskey Fest. Jason and I will be joining you at Glasgow's Whiskey Fest. So if there's any Padcast listeners who are joining that we've we've not met, and we've been jealous that, that only Jess has gotten to meet them, uh, then then we look forward to meeting you at Glasgow's Whiskey Fest. I'm phrasing this as uh, by popular demand because there are two or three people who every year turn up and are extremely disappointed that I am neither of you. So I'm going to use this as a great opportunity to actually go and try everybody else's whiskey and you two can do all the hard work. (laughs) Find us wandering the Uh festival, drinking other people's whiskey. Yeah, Yeah, I haven't haven't poured at that event with you since 2019, which was A, when we launched Global Bottles, and B, what, three months, four months before the world shut down. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, and before you guys come over for Glasgow Whiskey Festival, I am going to be in Poland at Whiskey Live Warsaw at the start of October. So that's mm-hmm. where you will find me. What, between what's your date on that? It's the 10th and 11th, I think, off the top of my head. Okay. Um, so cool. I will have a few goodies that I have arranged that are somewhere between here and Warsaw currently. Um, so there should be some nice things to drink there too um yeah so that's where you can find me for the next and i also have to give a shout out finally also in october it's i've got so much stuff to do before you two turn up um i will be pouring (laughs) at uh, the artisan restaurant in wishaw so anybody who's in scotland and knows whiskey but i also suspect a good chunk of people on facebook who do whiskey things will know or have been to or have heard of the artisan restaurant in Wishaw that's run by oh, yeah. uh, Derek Maver and Fiona, um, husband yep. and wife team. Yep. And, Appreciate the rest and support. And Indeed. his his dad, Willie, who's always in the kitchen helping too. Um, they've got a really lovely team. They have the most insane collection of whiskeys. Um, and every month, Derek puts on a whiskey dinner event. So October the 23rd is where you will be able to try some single castination whiskeys, maybe before they even get to Glasgow Whiskey Festival. Uh, and some hey. other goodies that I'll pull out of the bag. Um, he does um, a extremely filling three-course dinner, and then there's usually a mountain of cheese at the end. Um, there'll be some hopefully above-average <laughs> chat from me and some really nice whiskeys. So if you want to come to that, um, you can uh, reserve a space directly through um, Facebook, message the artisan and Derek there. Um, there's a couple of spaces left. Um, it always is a great night because it's a great restaurant, and I'm going solely to eat sticky toffee pudding. And talk to some people, obviously. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so is, okay, some... is it okay if I just show up for the mountain of cheese? Yeah, Have absolutely. And like, trust me, there's absolutely no way I can eat one of those cheese balls on my own. So you're very welcome <laughs> to tag team in, come and uh, yeah. join in with that. So that's where I'll be. Poland, Derek, and then you guys are uh, going to show up and we're going to go do some whiskey things in Glasgow too. There you go. That's say what, November 9, Glasgow's Whiskey Festival? Yeah, that's on the Saturday. And then we'll be in the good old Bon Accord afterwards, I strongly suspect, for some drinks with Thomas and the gang. Always. Yep, always. Yeah. So. Oh, what a, what a great note to get out of here on. That's oh, lots of things in the future to be looking forward to. Indeed. Well, Jess, as always, thanks so much for joining us. It's always a treat to have you on and to taste, to drink three whiskeys with you. Um even better and and of course to to johnny and to angus uh we wish you the best of luck with kyth distillery we'll be we'll be watching and waiting and hopefully get some sips along the way to see the the progress and uh and thanks of course to our dear listeners uh both stateside and around the world we appreciate you all let's get out of here on that (sighs) cheers listeners and cheers to you all yeah cheers everyone ready Oh, pro level. (laughs) 
So, uh, in, a, in a famous incomplete list kind of fashion, uh, let's see, what have we got in front of me? Uh, I have got... Not the right sheet. <laughs> edit, edit, yeah, snap, edit, edit, cut, twist. Oh, what have I done? I just have all of them in front of me as well. It's very annoying. Hang on, this will tell me. Edit, edit, snip. That's my lawyer said. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly it. That's why everything's just a little bit shorter for Joshua. Hey. Surprisingly, he, he, he was more the width he was focused on. Oh, my God. I, I don't know if... <laughs> the width? Man. Like he missed it? <laughs> what don't you have? It's like in a pencil sharpener. Or time for this nonsense. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Jess. Sharpener. Okay, Dad. Okay. <laughs> I the handle. <laughs> it was desk mounted. Ow, 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 ow. Do you have to, like, turn the baby as the... Oh, yeah, you turn the baby. That's what you do. You turn the baby. It's a stationary pencil sharpener. You just... You turn the baby. Oh, my God. This We're definitely... The Easter egg ever. Straight to jail for both of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got what you need, Jess? Yeah. <laughs> Grossed out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we have a little list. Le- leaves a taste. <laughs> um, here. <laughs> uh, that's really hard to get out of my mind. 